All right, great. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, team. Yes, sir. All right, wonderful. Well, let's go ahead and mute up the crowd, Ryan. I'll do a quick presentation of the trade alert. Then we'll do some charts, some news, some Q&A. And we do have a guest speaker today who's going to talk about tax secrets. So how to keep that money you make away from the old IRS there. <laughs> You're good to go. Hey, Ron uh, and Mike, I'll make sure to address your question uh, after we get through the trade alert. Uh, so yeah, guys, uh, we're only gonna change the bond and gold positions on Thursday. So nothing to stress out about. Those positions are rock solid and protected. So I'll do my best to answer that, but I'm gonna try to focus on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays really completely focused on building the foundation of our portfolio. So we think of the portfolio as a house. Today's the day to lay your foundation uh, so that you have a strong, uh, strong foundation to put up your walls, which right now are cash. So I know we're just kind of sitting around waiting for this market to sell off so we can buy up assets at a great discount and really have some easy profits ahead. Uh, okay, so let me start off by looking at our teaser for the webinar, then we'll go through the trade alert, then we we'll look at charts and news, and then I'll do Q&A, and then hand it over to our tax specialist who has a presentation uh, to help you guys as well. Okay, so the, as you guys know, I've been tracking the Chinese-US political relationship uh, with the bulk of my time since the trade war began, was skeptical that we would have a trade deal because the phase two trade deal was really uh, akin to clipping the wings or declawing the cat. And that this was really not going to work for China as they uh, really want to become the leader in the world and not be uh, America's little puppet. Uh, and so that's why I was skeptical that we'd get a trade one deal and was certain that we would never get the phase two. And again, the phase two was asking China to give up their competitive advantage in the world, um, which just doesn't make sense. They have their whole economy revolving around a centralized system that does give them a huge unfair advantage in any sector they wanna take over. So that's what this trade battle is all about. And it's unfortunately something that will probably be ongoing for decades to come. Uh, so when this first started, the Chinese stock market began to crash right after we signed a trade deal with uh, between U.S. and China that was supposed to be just beautiful. Emerging markets was going to outperform stocks, yields were going to rise. We had exactly the opposite setup we do currently. Uh, but the giveaway was after this trade deal signed, Chinese stock market was tanking, and there's really no justified cause for it. And who would have guessed that there was a disease spreading that would wipe out financial markets worldwide? Um, so they've done everything they can to, uh, to not report the truth, as have other governments, uh, to slow down the testing, to stop panics from arising. And so at this point, the, the best indicator that I'm currently following uh, after, as you know, following this daily, watching it grow exponentially, is now I think the best leading indicator for economic destruction uh, is to watch the deaths in a logarithmic scale. So if you look at the left-hand chart here, it's not 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, it's 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. So this is an easy way to tell if something's growing exponentially or if it's uh, flattening out. And so uh, what I think the economy can deal with would be a steady set of new deaths per day, which would mean that our isolation tactics are working and that the healthcare system is going to be able to stabilize and deal with a steady flow uh, versus a exponentially growing amount of hospitalizations. Now, again, I don't think the mortality rates really what's going to wreck the economy uh, but it is the 
amount of people who need ventilators and hospitalization, which currently is about two out of 10 infected uh, cases. So that's really the big choke in the economy and what will cripple uh, hospitals, healthcare, and force governments to slowly but surely tiptoe into these lockdowns. And so I've been predicting we'd have a lockdown that we would not be opening back up for Easter and that uh, our president would slowly but surely change his tune. And sure, sure enough, he has. Uh, so my next prediction is that we will have to do a 60 day global synchronized uh, martial law style shutdown, not this sort of quasi shutdown that we're currently in where people can uh, do whatever they want. It's just harder to get around because most shops are shut down. So there's still plenty of people uh, mingling and spreading the disease. So the logarithmic scale we can count on there. It's probably five days behind, uh, but they're tracking that more accurately than anything else. Uh, and it's a lot easier, obviously, to test everybody passing away versus uh, the entire population. So this is going to be our leading indicator. What I want to see to believe that the economic destruction is at least going to be slowed down uh, and have some sort of glimpse at timing to, uh, to construct the walls of our, of our house, which is going to be buying up those ETFs we've been talking about, is to see this flat line uh, for at least several weeks and then likely uh, hopefully start to uh, to peter down um, now timeline on that again i don't believe this will happen until after there's a synchronized global shutdown that's been in effect for probably 60 days now bill gates is out there saying 10 weeks um, but again it doesn't work if only one country does it it only works if the entire world does it at once and then the entire world emerges with mass. And it's no coincidence that the guest speakers in these daily press conferences coming up talking about how they are mass producing masks right now uh, as we're in dire need of these. Uh, so that's my prediction moving forward is that we're gonna have to do a global synchronized shutdown that's much more strict than current. Uh, and that around the 60 day mark, we can allow people to reemerge with masks and it'll be something like putting the fire out. So we just have tiny little uh, sparks here and there that we can contain and uh, have a manageable crisis for our healthcare system. Uh, so that's the big picture. Let's go ahead and uh, look at our trade alert. So as you guys know, we have several products. We have three trading plans really. We have the buy and hold uh, which there's no changes. And that's ideal for portfolios that are much smaller. And again, that will only be updated Monday, but I can tell you first off that our buy and hold portfolio, which I've mentioned at the very bottom of this email, it'll only change on Mondays, but I don't expect to make any changes at all for the next three to six months minimum. Uh, that's how long I think the stock market crash will take to unfold at a, at a very bare bones minimum. Um, so expect that to be the case and uh, very few changes in that. So I'm not going to review the buy and hold except for on Mondays, but do note that you can go back to the Monday update and it's very clearly written out how to invest every thousand dollars for the buy and hold strategy. And again, there's no changes to that portfolio. Uh, for pro members, We've been confusing people trying to discuss multiple trading plans uh, on the same day. So I'm afraid my recommendation from last Thursday is still exactly the same today and it will still be the same tomorrow. So any changes we're gonna make to what we call the roof of your house uh, will be updated on Thursday. And if you're just getting started, I do highly recommend that you just wait to the next Thursday to follow that trading plan. We're not trying to be a crazy day trader. We're not trying to get rich quick. Uh, you know, we're the turtle that's going to win the race because we're calm, patient, collected, and we're not in a rush. So that's really key to the system is we're not trying to be a cheetah. You're the tortoise and we're gonna get you through the finish line uh, with low volatility and uh, 
lots of applause at the end of the race. Okay, so let's go look at today's trade alert. Again, the focus of today is to ensure that our clients, whether you're in the basic program or the pro program, you have the proper foundation, the floor of your house laid with cement. Okay, and so that floor that you're building today is to have a set of five put options. These put options represent at current prices around four to 5% of your total assets. And they give you downside protection against a stock market crash for two years. So we can start to sell these as we get below the strike by about $20 uh, on each of these and also have confidence to begin purchasing what I'm calling the walls will be your ETFs we're gonna rotate into. So we'll take a look at what we're gonna rotate into but it's really critical that we have this crash insurance in place first. And uh, I'm not trying to time my crash insurance. I don't try to time my car insurance. I don't try to time uh, health insurance. And I wouldn't try to time life insurance. That's the whole point is that it's an unexpected sudden change that you wanna have insurance against. Now, in this case, we don't own stocks, so we're not hedging our position. But when we do buy stocks, we want to have these positions to protect against further downside risk, as well as an opportunity to generate profits. Okay, so let's review uh, the current instructions that we have, which is to purchase one of each of these put options for these four per $75,000. So we're buying to open one June 19, 2020, 220 SPY put per $75,000. Now, if I had $150,000 following the program, and again, this is whether you're in the basic or pro system, if I had 150,000, I would double that. So I'd have two. So let's just edit this for fun to pretend we had 150,000 for a learning experience. So you'd be buying to open two of each of these and six of this. Let's say I had 300,000 following. So we're gonna go up to four and 12. Okay, so this is the only task we're asking of our members to be accomplished at this point today. Now, most of you put these on when I first put them on, but there's new people always onboarding. So this is the only action that you need to worry about today. Okay, so I'm reversing it back to the initial block. Now, what if you're starting out with a lot less than 75,000? Then in that case, I would delete these if it was based on a 30,000. Okay, so you'll have the short-term protections that get us through 2020. So that's the only modification I would consider if you had less than uh, less than 75,000 to follow. It's just to drop off the 2022 leap puts. Okay, so those are your five put options. Again, our intention is to sell these after the SPY goes below each target or if we truly believe a bottom is in. Okay, so that's something that uh, the timing of which I'll be making the call. Now, let me pull up the ETFs we're gonna be looking to rotate into just so we're well aware of the assets that we're interested in purchasing once there's enough blood on the streets. And fortunately for us, it won't be our own blood because uh, we're in cash and we did that at a very good time <laughs> early in the year. Hey, Jason, uh, I love your analogy on the insurance, right? Uh, for for the crash, right? And it's, it, <clears throat> so guys, we're gonna tell you when to exit the position and when to make your claim, right? But you want to have your insurance now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like there's an asteroid coming towards Earth. We, we don't, you know, we can try to measure it as best as we can. We know it's going to crash into Earth. Uh, so it makes sense to get that insurance now. And, and yeah, the target return on those puts are upwards of 500 to 10,000%, depending on which one it is and how vicious this crash goes. So I'm, I'm not worried about a little drawdown if the market's bouncing around because of a $6 trillion stimulus plan. Uh, but the bottom line is that 
the, the Fed has done everything they can to provide shock and awe and liquidity. Uh, and now what's ahead is miserable, miserable economic data for the foreseeable future. Um, so, okay, so what are the companies we want to build the walls of our house with? So again, your cement flooring is the put options. Not only will that likely be the only trade you need to have a great return for all of 2020, it's going to also give us the confidence and the downside protection to rotate out of cash into these five sectors, which I believe will be the greatest benefactors immediately of all the government stimulus. So the government is going to raise trillions and trillions of dollars to the bond market. That's really my favorite play right now. Again, I'm expecting a vicious stock market crash, but a slow, steady grind into the bond market. And, and the reason why is they, it's gonna take them a while to raise $2 trillion. Plus we gotta think of all the debt that's going to be created uh, from not collecting taxes, from slowdown in growth. Uh, so the bottom line is the bond market needs to raise money at a greater pace than it ever has in history. And there's no end in sight. It's going to likely take at least two years. The entire period in which uh, the government has to pull resources out of a limited economy and drive those resources into the bond market is going to be destructive for all other asset classes. The only exception I can see is the direct recipients of all the money they're going to raise. And so who's gonna get all this cash? Well, healthcare, biotech, medical devices, and I believe we'll soon be at war. Uh, so I also like the defense ETF, ITA. Um, now, e-commerce isn't getting any bailouts directly, but with small businesses being shut down, you really have no option. Um, so I still think that these were all going to crash with the S&P 500. So that's why we're not jumping into it now. Uh, quite likely the time range is in three to six months, uh, probably closer to six months. So we gotta think about first we need the bond market to start raising all this capital. That's going to divert resources and money flows from the big players. And we're talking central banks, we're talking primary dealers. So JP Morgan, City, all the big banks, they by law have to pick up all this debt. So if you think the banks are gonna lose money uh, borrowing uh, or rather lending money to the government, I've got, uh, you know, you got another thing coming for you. So timeline is likely the stock crash will just get started in April. There'll be plenty of volatility in both directions, up and down, uh, but, the solution that creates the least economic harm is not to slowly but surely do these quasi isolations. That's not going to work. You're going to see uh, New York City is going to be completely overran by uh, April 15th. By April 30th, it's going to be a complete madhouse. And you're going to start seeing other cities, uh, especially crowded, dense cities, uh, starting to have chaos as well. Um, so timeline, we got a long time to sit on these puts. They're going to appreciate slowly but surely until the spy goes below the strike. Once the spy goes below your strike, that's when the profits become exponential and we'll start looking to slowly let go of those. Um, but really the, the solution that I believe the governments are gonna finally come to is that we have to have a synchronized global shutdown that's strict, not we trust you to, to be good, but strict confinement for no less than 60 days and re-emerge with mass. And I believe that's going to play out. And uh, sometime around there is when I believe we'll have this under control and we can get everybody back to work. And I also like to think of it as a workout. A lot of people think there's going to be this pent up demand that's just going to explode GDP numbers right when uh, the economy goes back live. But I, I think of it as a workout. Imagine you're running sprints uh, or miles and you, you had a six minute mile time and then you took a two to three month break. Now, sure, you're still working out as hard as you can on your treadmill, but it's really not the same. Uh, so I expect the economy to slowly but surely get back to old economic output and not to immediately do so. So um, 
finding the bottom will be tricky. Probably at some point, the Fed's going to have to come in and actually put a, a floor on the stock market, at least in key industries, which they don't have the legal rights to do yet. So we'll see if that happens. Uh, but these are the companies that I believe will be the direct benefactor of the trillions of dollars governments now going to drain out of economies uh, and fund directly healthcare, biotech, medical devices, e-commerce, and then if we go to war. Uh, also, just think about the military budget. That's one thing you can count on like clockwork to increase year after year after year. Okay, so let me go back to the trade alerts. Uh, so your only job today is to get your foundation built. That's the set of five put options. I have not added to it or changed it. This is an appropriate amount of risk and downside protection. Uh, I said as early as Friday, I may add to it. Uh, but at this point, no promises on that. I'm pretty content with our downside protection and ready to uh, sit back. Uh, the pro membership, which trades Thursdays only. If you have the bootcamp trade, your QQQ put is doing well today. Your silver uh, leap call option bonus trades pulled back a little bit, but all in all, the hedges provided in the bootcamp are helping keep our return healthy for March. Now, we had an insane 15% return for like three days in March uh, when the TLT popped to 180. We'll look at the chart. I think we're going to blow past 180. It's unfortunate we didn't take some profits, uh, but compared to everybody else in this market, we're really just killing it. Even just having a flat return in 2020, you're an absolute rock star because everyone else was long stocks. They thought that the uh, honey badger disease was nothing to worry about and how hard to blame people when all of the media and all the people you trust told you such. The WHO, I remember them telling us don't worry about this. China says it's not contagious. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so if you're in the buy and hold, or rather in the boot, uh, in the pro membership with no boot camp, you're flat currently. Uh, if you're in the basic membership, there's not been a lot of action. We've been trying to catch a pop in the spy uh, early on with the married put strategy. Miss those, we're just slowly bleeding to the point that we just decided to go outright short. Uh, so we currently have a little drawdown on that portfolio. But keep in mind that the positions that we've put on give us protection for the next two years. So if you average out that drawdown uh, at, for a 24 month period, then you're looking at tiny, tiny amounts of risk spread out over a two year, two year period. So it's not like we've put on a risky position that ends in March. Uh, so that's why I don't get concerned about that drawdown that we have. So again, I put these trades on 320. You can get into them for between a 30 to 50% discount today. I'm not telling anyone to double up. I'm not telling anyone to add extra exposure. This is the best bet uh, to just have this simple low risk setup of these five puts. Now, if we add to it, uh, well, you'll be the first to know, but for now, that's really the setup. Um, and again, these are all buy to open. One, 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 and three per $75,000 falling. Now, this is the same whether you're a pro member or a basic member. So there's no difference. We're allocating everything based on 75000 Okay, let me look at some charts, some news, and then we'll go into Q&A. Okay, so this is the chart we've been showing for quite some time. Uh, if you guys remember for the last three months, I was predicting that these two would cross over on a percent change basis. And sure enough, they have. Uh, we've got a little bit of a bounce here at this resistance level, uh, which I think will be short lived as the economic data is going to get brutal. And uh, a lot of people like to look at moving averages, all kinds of technical analysis, but really the stock market at the end of the day is going to be based on uh, revenues and profits and the future of those revenues and profits. And so uh, everything we know about fundamental analysis of equities is really thrown out the window right now. 
uh, because of the change in our environment. So until it's more clear how long this is going to last, which companies are going to thrive, how are consumers' habits going to change after this? Uh, it's going to really uh, put a twist on all the valuations of all the different companies. So right now, again, I like to just have those simple put options and sit back uh, for the S&P 500. Now for the pro members on Thursday, as you know, you have a huge percentage of your capital in the TLT, and you also have some extra call options. So I did have a question, shouldn't I be selling a call, not buying a call? And the answer is no, you should be buying the call. If I buy a call, that means I'm trying to get extra risk in betting up on that asset. If I sold a call option, I'd actually think that we had no growth ahead. So clearly I'm extremely bullish on the bond market because those are the guys who control the printing press and interest rates. So with the stock market, we really need profits, revenue growth, consumption, all these good things to predict on a bullish stock market. Um, in the bond market, that's not the case. All we need to predict is will the Fed drop interest rates and print money? And so that's quite clearly what they're doing and willing to do uh, in order to fund these massive stimulus bills we passed. So I was the first to predict that we'd be not spending. Remember the first bill they passed was $8 billion? I said, that's a joke. It's going to cost trillions. Okay, well, a month later, they passed a $2 trillion stimulus bill. Now they're talking about a $2 trillion infrastructure bill. Uh, it's simple math. If you have limited tax revenue and you're going to ramp up government spending, uh, you got to remember, this is not a video game where we can type in a cheat code to get extra economic output. Uh, so these dollars represent economic output. They're not just funny money. And so if we're going to have a, a dramatic decrease in economic output and we're going to ramp up government spending, well, those resources have to come from somewhere. And I believe it's going to not only be stock markets globally that are crushed, uh, but also likely at this point, real estate, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so that's the jaw of death closing in, which we predicted well before it's occurred. And unfortunately, I think this trend will continue for quite some time. And, and the top line is what? And this, those are two standard deviations on either side of the top line. Is that what's going on there? We have the green and red candlesticks for the SPY. Uh -huh. And then we have the TLT in orange. Okay. I'm, just, I'm colorblind. That's why I'm asking. So top line is? Top line is SPY. Yep. yep. And the bottom line is TLT. Now I have just a pitchfork technical line here for the SPY that we were using for quite some time. But you can see it just viciously broke through all technical support levels. So technicians probably would have been telling you to buy here, to buy here, to buy here. And then now that it bounced, like, oh, of course it bounced there. That's obvious. But I believe they would have said the same thing at every single technical line we just crushed through. Okay, let's look at the SPY on its own. Uh, so, you know, obvious support lines are here, 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 probably midway through that. And then I think the Fed wouldn't let it go below uh, the bottom of 2008. So, so keep in mind, the crash we had in 2008 was predominantly from uh, $300 billion of mortgage assets that were packaged into derivatives, probably valued at $3 trillion. So we got a 50% crash that took a year for the economy to absorb those losses and recover from a small housing bubble where we lent money to uh, low-income folks. Okay, so that was pretty easy for the economy to absorb. And again, it's the same playbook. If we have a, a loss, it's too big for a bank. Banks love to find bad investments out there. They'll come in there and buy your company up for pennies on the dollar, take over ownership, make you still be a slave to it, and then they'll go pump up your stock again. So they love to do that when they can. But when the problem gets too immense, then they have to use a government to partner with the banks to do the same effect. And so that's what we did in the dot-com bubble and the 08 crash was drop rates to zero, let's primary dealers borrow from the Fed for free, buy up government debt, which acts as a drain on, the, on all other markets. And that's why you get these stock crashes when we cut rates to zero. 
is because it's incentivizing banks, primarily the ones who control the Fed, to buy up government debt. Okay, so if you think that this crash is of lesser magnitude than 300 billion in bad loans, then I've got news for you. This is at least 100 times worse. So that's why I predict this is going to go on for much longer than, than people expect. Now, the, the good news is the real solution isn't that bad, at least from a logistic standpoint. Um, 60 day lockdown and then reemerge with mass, this problem is wiped out. And it's proven to do just that in China. It, at least it's wiped out to the point where our healthcare system can easily cope with, it's not the mortality again that's causing economic distress, it's the hospitalization rate, it's the ICU beds, it's the ventilators. That's what we have a short supply of. And uh, when it's infecting perhaps 50% of the people it comes in contact with, and then two out of 10 of those infected are having to go to the hospital for a serious stay. That's what's flooding the hospital system. That's why we have to shut down these economies. So if we have every country kind of doing their own thing uh, with these quasi measures, this crash can go on for much longer and the full effect of the economic destruction will be much greater. But if they act quickly, and get the whole world on board, or at least isolate any country that doesn't follow with economic sanctions, which again, would really help fund our bond market, then I think they can reduce the impact of the economic destruction and get everybody to back to work much sooner. And so again, I point out that in these press conferences, what are they doing? They're bringing up manufacturers saying that they're mass producing masks. We had the CDC say, oh yeah, actually we probably should be wearing Mass. The only reason they told people not to do that was because there weren't enough. Um, so that's the solution. It's going to be painful. It's going to take a while for the recovery. Um, but that's the only way out of it that I can, can find it with a thousand hours plus of researching this. And it's not going to cost too much. So that's the good news. The bad news is how long will it take to get everyone to change their habits, to change the social norm um, right now, people don't want to wear a mask because no one else is wearing a mask. So until it's cool, um, that's really what's going to slow us down. Okay, so that's a look at the S&P 500. We're going to have big up days. We're going to have even bigger down days. I, I do want to point out that the 2008 crash, most of the crash was in a handful of trading days, like five. Most of the other days, it was flat or bouncing, rocketing higher. Um, so that's the nature of these stock market crashes is that the big plunges happen in a handful of trading days. Uh, so if you don't have the position built, you're going to miss the move. Just as simple as that. And uh, because, you know, this is not like we're not just slowly watching consumers become delinquent. We're not slowly watching consumers become delinquent on their mortgages, which you could watch just slowly unfold. What we're watching is uh, exponential growth. That means every 14 days, the magnitude of the economic destruction is tenfold. And right now, really, it's just, you know, New York City is having some pretty extreme pressure, but the rest of the country is not really maxed out yet. In 14 days, New York is going to be completely chaotic. And I think you're going to start seeing more pressure on other states. In 30 days, uh, any large city is going to probably be having uh, a lot of maximum output into the hospital system. Uh, so, the, so the timeline is just not working in our favor. Now, unfortunately, the, the cure is 60 days, and it's going to crush economic data for the next two months once we do get into that full-blown lockdown. Um, and I think that's going to be around the period when everybody's running for the woods and super panic uh, and probably getting close to our time to buy. So the exact opposite of the, the herd. Okay, here's our TLT. Uh, this is the high print we saw. I told folks, take some profits if you got bills to pay, otherwise I'm holding. And from predicting the stock market to continue crashing through March, we nailed it, but predicting that 
uh, central banks, risk parity funds, people who were selling uh, puts against oil would be so crushed they'd have to liquidate treasuries. I didn't foresee that to such a great magnitude. And so we, we missed out on taking some huge profits for March. A 15% return is absolutely ridiculous. That's not something we're even trying to achieve in this program. Uh, but every once in a while, the, the cards line up, you get that, you get that full house. Uh, so TLT crashed as low as 44. We didn't budge. We didn't change outlook. We didn't change anything. All we did was buy a downside put and the market popped right back up in the bond market. So again, my long-term predictions are that we'll see some resistance again at the 180 level. I think of the Pavlov dog experiment. The dog's been trained that once we hit that 1% yield on the 30 year to take some profit. So I'll probably get us out well before that, expecting some volatility uh, to re-enter and lock in some gains. So again, Thursday is when we're playing the bond market. We're not going to change that uh, position except for Thursdays, unless there's an absolute emergency. Now, on the note of the bond market, this is really what's been holding me back from increasing risk exposure is we want to see how fast are you going to sell this debt and how well is it going to be received. I think it's going to be well received, and I believe that it's going to be a slow, steady grind in the bond market. Uh, but on uh, tomorrow, we'll see just how much they're going to try to sell on the 9th, and we'll see how well that's received. And we can start getting a little more brave uh, in the bond market after that. So I don't anticipate actually making any changes um, in our bond position tomorrow. Maybe sell one of our TLT calls, if anything. But I am going to wait to see how this plays out uh, to add to the position. Uh, so what, what else are they doing? They're going to add the 20 year. That'll be part of the TLT. They want to add a 50 and 100 year bond, uh, but they're having technical issues with that. So they have a lot of money to raise. The people funding it are big banks, total insiders who control the central banks. Uh, and so this is by far my highest confidence trade. And again, that's on Thursday. We'll cover that in great deal tomorrow. Okay, the dollar index. So we printed essentially $6 trillion. We now have a repo for treasuries, not just for US banks, but for all of the world. So the Fed's doing everything they can to prevent anyone from selling US debt. Um, and $6 trillion of stimulus, or at least forward guidance of stimulus, dropped the dollar index for a few weeks, but now it's already starting to bid up. Uh, again, a strong dollar is really bad for stocks in general. Uh, so the higher this gets, I believe the more vicious the stock market will become. Here's our 30 year US product in the bond market compared to uh, in the candlestick chart in the, I'll change the color on that so it's a little more obvious, oops. Okay, here's the German 30 year. Now we used to look at the German 30 year as a good leading indicator because China was really the, uh, the bad actor and was having the most economic problems. Um, but now we're realizing China's government structure is far better at coping with a crisis like this. Uh, their ruthlessness towards their people allows them to really not pay trillions of dollars, to try to save all the old in fact, what did they do? They locked everybody in their apartments and you either survived or you died. Um, and that's that. Now we got riots all over China. Uh, lots of, you go look at Hong Kong, people are getting shot in the streets. Uh, they're trying to open up their economy. They're saying that their PMI is back above 50. It's just a joke. Um, so also interesting China, Germany, and Russia seem to have had the least impact from this. Funny that they're all highly partnered with China. Uh, bottom line is the US may have greater economic trouble in the short term than China or Germany, but this has been the best leading indicator of the future direction of the bond market. So let me just zoom that out. 
And so currently it's still pointing obviously towards uh, lower yields, which means the TLT will go up. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if, if this spread decreases. Now I'm gonna remove the percent change. And we can see that 30 year on the German bond is about to go negative. Uh, at the low, it was at 0.22, so negative 22 basis points. So again, for us to predict how high the TLT can go, we do wanna see competing bond markets, primarily Germany's, go lower and lower into negative territory, uh, which will mean that there's room for ours to go lower and lower on our 30-year product. So that's looking good from that standpoint. Let's see, where's my... Uh, the other good predictor of the bond market is the copper to gold ratio. So uh, copper is a good signal of growth because it's used in lots of construction, whereas gold is reacted to in times of devaluation of fiat currencies and inflationary risk. Uh, so uh, you can see the gold copper ratios crashing lower and lower. So that does point that yields are headed far lower and is another backstop for our long TLT position. Okay, let's take a look at emerging markets. So emerging markets contains Hong Kong, China, South Korea, Russia, India, the whole general area. FXI, we have China large cap, which is the top performing of these assets, way up here, way outperforming its peers. Uh, we have the SPY in purple. Then we have uh, South Korea in turquoise. So South Korea is an ally of the United States. So you can see those two are underperforming. Uh, China is outperforming. And I believe that there's a high risk of Chinese equities being completely outlawed or highly restricted from US investments. Uh, so I do expect at some point to flip out our short emerging market put, which is up, I think 800% today and flip that out for a put option on FXI at some point. And, and I may add that tomorrow, we'll see. If we get a bounce tomorrow, I'll likely add that as a new position. So what happens if US outlaws FXI completely? Uh, well then, if that were to go to zero, we get the full price of the strike minus the cost of the premium. So you get the maximum payout. So that is a great deal. And if you believe that uh, this is a coordinated attack on the oil market um, and the supply chains by China and Russia, uh, then you definitely want to predict that U.S. is going to uh, retaliate. And so the best strategy U.S. could do would be to start choking it economically and most likely not mil mil with a, a hot war. So what can they do? They can simply say, all right, no more money to China. You guys are not playing nice. Uh, so we're going to cut you off of the dollar. Okay, gold market. Everybody's freaking out about the gold. Well, there's a good sign for you. Um, so GLD has broken past with the SPY in the most recent push right here. So that's really good news uh, for us who have believed that gold was correlated to stocks. Um, now, if we go look at some of the other products we're interested in, we have GDX gold miners in orange. And you can see it's even starting to break away from the SPY right here. Let me zoom in on this. So, so just a heads up, no change to our gold position tomorrow. Uh, but look, so we have stocks starting to sell off here. And let me zoom in even more for you guys. So the fundamental analysis for owning a gold miner is beautiful right now. Oil's cheap. Who knows, it might, might go to even lower levels than it is. It looks like it's gonna go far lower than it is now. Uh, so what's the risk for a, a gold miner? Well, yeah, maybe there's periods of time where we can't go get our full crew mining gold right now, uh, but we have every central bank printing money at record pace, devaluing their currencies, issuing massive fiscal deficits, uh, at a time uh, where they're also stockpiling gold and doing their best to, to try to manipulate it. So every time gold spikes up too high, you can see central banks are dumping it. We know that 
GLD is more of a fractional reserve. Um, so it's not like a normal, it's not just a hundred percent of GLD's assets under management actually own gold. In fact, there's a huge, huge discrepancy in trying to buy real metal, precious metals versus trying to have um, exposure to it from these different uh, paper traded assets. Um, so that's a really good sign that you want to own the physical metal. So who actually produces physical metal? Gold miners do. So I love the gold miner position. I think this will be one of our longest buy and hold positions. So we're using the married put. And again, that means we have a put option protecting every 100 shares of GDX. So no changes there. I'll cover it in detail tomorrow, uh, but gold is looking very good. So we have the quantitative easing is really the key to be long gold. And we're starting to see the stock market break paths with uh, the different assets that do trade gold. So that's really good news to see that. Uh, Silver is still being treated like trash or is something more of a growth metal versus a safe haven metal. Uh, but I think that that's going to skyrocket as this continues to build. So we're just starting to, to turn on the printing presses. We're just starting to issue the debt. Um, so it does take some time for it to go from printing press to the bond market to however the government's gonna spend that money and then flow through the economy, create inflation, and then you get your big pop in precious metals. So I, I do think the big move for 2020 is definitely the bond market, but I don't think gold's gonna get crushed. I think they're gonna to try to do their best to suppress it uh, but they're going to have a hard time at doing that. So I will look to add to our long gold position, whether it's spot gold through GLD with call options, or if it's owning the underlying asset with a married put on GDX, I will slowly but surely grow that position in 2020. And by slowly, I'm talking about every uh, quarter, not every day or every week or anything of that nature. So on a quarterly basis, expect for me to gradually take more and more risk in those two products, which will be uh, GLD and GDX for the pro members. And if you're in the boot camp, we're looking at the same similar setup with leap options on the silver market. Uh, but very good sign today to see a divergence between the SPY and the gold miners, as well as spot gold staying, staying up. Uh, and uh, Bill Richardson, did that answer your question? And a great question, by the way, too, Bill. Uh, nice, uh, you know, nice way to think outside of the box. Okay, the next chart I'm going to look at is the dollar index, which again is a basket of lots of currencies against other currencies against the, the dollar. So the safe haven currency, the Japanese yen is going up, as you can see, alongside the dollar. Whereas other competing currencies, the Euro. Uh, now I put up the Australian dollar just to, to kind of look as a leading indicator. So they're highly tied to China. Uh, so weakness in the Australian dollar is bad for stocks in general. And so if you want to plan a trip, be safe, but look at Australia as now your buying power is twice as much as it was uh, just, just a few months ago at the end of 2018. Uh, we're also seeing Chinese currency in the orange right here, losing value. Now they're not going to like that. So I bet you they start to devalue their currency, uh, which again creates a chain reaction. So every time China devalues their currency, that gives them an unfair advantage against all of their trading partners. So they start to devalue. And then what happens? Your dollar keeps pushing higher and higher. And what are you gonna do if you need dollars because you have lots of debt? Let's say you live in somewhere in Asia and you have a huge amount of debt that you've borrowed in dollars and your interest payments coming up, but you've ran out of dollars. Well, are you gonna sell your local currency which is valued at half for dollars to pay the interest? Or are you gonna maybe sell a US stock That'll give you a whole bunch of dollars, won't it? Especially if the dollar is relatively strong. So uh, weakening emerging market currencies and strengthening dollar will create lots of pressure in equities is the bottom line of the point of this chart right here. All right, what's going on in commodities? 
this is really what created the big pain and caught the world off guard. So there's a lot of money involved in oil, obviously. The Aramco is the most profitable business on the planet. And they're in an outright war with Russia, uh, just dumping oil into the market. Uh, so we can see this huge crash in oil. And unfortunately, I think it will go much lower. Now, as you know, in our pro system, we cannot wait to buy up US oil and US natural gas. Uh, but I think they are nowhere near a bottom yet. And again, that's because I do believe that uh, our foes are trying to essentially bankrupt America by forcing us to spend a massive amount of money in the bond market and eventually lead to devaluation of the dollar. Um, so their plan's working, stock market's crashing, oil market's crashing, government's issuing trillions and trillions. Uh, and so it's just a matter of time now, I'm afraid. Uh, so yeah, oil keeps crashing as do these other uh, products related to it. So again, we will love to buy up USO and UNG with the married put strategy once we get further into this crisis, but I think it's just getting started, unfortunately. Okay, so now in this one, we're not trading crypto in our pro or basic program. I will give you what I'm doing personally in this space in the boot camp. Now, again, I don't recommend more than a 1% position total at risk. In cryptos, it's really correlated to your gold position. So it's not a big deal if you're not but the cryptos have been acting as a good leading indicator for stocks, which is completely odd. Uh, but the way it works is a lot of these big banks, they have the same thing. They're saying, all right, we'll put 1% into these crypto assets um, because it's had such a high return and we don't really care about anything else. And we're gonna systematically sell stocks in downturns and systematically buy stocks and crypto in upturns. And so, in the blue and purple, we have the top two cryptocurrencies. Although this is funny, let me just pull this up so you guys can. So the gold market cap, at least a few years ago was something like $8 trillion for spot gold. Um, the gold miners, I'm not sure what the market cap, it's small, but Bitcoin is just tiny, tiny, tiny. So it's only $113 billion market cap, so it's super, uh, risky. So uh, my prediction for cryptos is it's going to tank and you're going to be able to buy these for super cheap. So I am expecting that. But this is really funny. The new top crypto coin is toilet paper token. Uh, supply out of stock and it's up a thousand. So it's just a joke. Um, but yeah, what can we glean from looking at cryptocurrencies, even for those of you who aren't buying cryptos? Okay. So Let's look at some correlations here. So during this period, and again, the candlestick is US stock market, S&P 500. So during this period, we can see stocks sold off. And during this period, Ethereum and Bitcoin sell off. Okay, but what began to sell off first? Well, clearly you can see cryptocurrencies actually began to sell off well before the stock market sold off. So it's actually looking at the momentum of the stock market slowing down for a signal to dump these risk assets. Okay, what happened during this period in the SP 500? It went up. Okay, now what happened to Bitcoin and cryptos? It also went up, but which asset went up first? Funny enough, cryptocurrencies went up first. Okay, so what happened here? We have stocks starting to sell off, but what began to sell off first? The cryptocurrencies did. So I do believe that these are providing another canary in the coal mine element for us to try to predict moves. Now, I don't think the crypto market is causing the stock market to sell off. I'm not saying that. Uh, but I do believe at this point in time, they're highly correlated and the big players in it are systematically selling these in tandem. Um, so from that perspective, if you're holding crypto, my current forecast is that unfortunately, unlike gold, which has begun to break paths with the stock market, the cryptocurrencies are not. And uh, central banks don't buy cryptocurrencies, at least not publicly. Maybe they do through some secret 
funds, which I wouldn't be surprised on, uh, but they do buy gold. And although they try to suppress the value of gold and from an economic standpoint, if we get everybody buying gold, that helps no one except for themselves. So the central banks want to incentivize buying stocks to support the real economy. And they want to support buying bonds to support the government who's going to bail out the real economy. So they will do everything they can to make sure that people don't get too wild about gold, even though the central banks themselves continue to hoard gold. Even though there's this huge discrepancy between spot gold and of course, paper gold. Okay, last chart to look at. We're talking about building those walls on our house. We've got the flooring laid out. Uh, so that's set to jet. I look at the precious metals, the commodities as kind of the plumbing and the electricity of your house. That represents 10% allocations. 40% is in uh, the walls and the flooring, 40% is on your roof. And then, uh, so we got 40% dedicated to US equities one way or another. We have 40% dedicated to bonds, which again is our roof. Um, so the pipes, electricity can be our, our commodities place. Uh, so the walls, again, we have healthcare, biotech, medical device, e-commerce, and defense. Let's see how they're shaping up against the general market as of current. So like I said, even though those assets are going to be the direct beneficiary, we still have systematic selling of all assets, regardless of any fundamental analysis to worry about. Um, so the time is not yet to buy these. It'll probably be in three to six months at the earliest. Um, after the money has been raised through the government and is beginning to get funneled through the pipelines to these companies. Okay, so the green and red candlestick chart is the SP 500. Uh, what's doing the worst? The Boeing, that's the big asset in the purple one, uh, but there's a lot of other military products in that. So this will probably be our best bargain value play. As far as growth, all of these companies, XLV, IBB, IHI, and ONLN, the ETFs, I do believe have tremendous growth opportunity because of the paradigm shift of how our new economy is going to operate. Uh, all the changes in spending habits, et cetera. Uh, also, the direct bailouts of government bonds being handed directly into these key sectors. So we can see uh, the ones we have handpicked. Uh, and again, I didn't go look at a million ETFs and see which ones are outperforming the SPY. I looked at where's the stimulus going from a fundamental standpoint, no cherry picking, put them on the chart and lo and behold, they're outperforming the general market. So it makes sense. Uh, so what's the best performing one currently is uh, XLV, but also IHI has done very well in general. Um, Online e-commerce is right up there. So Amazon's probably gonna have one of the best prints of all time um, in terms of revenue for Q1 2020. But again, I think the whole ship's gonna sink before we wanna layer into building our walls on our house. Okay, great. So that is a wrap up for the charts I wanna review. Let's look at some news clips and then we'll do Q and A. And then we'll get to our tech specialist who's, uh, do we have Aaron on there? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Aaron. Whoa. Welcome, welcome. All right, we're closing in. We'll do some Q&A and then it'll be your time to shine. Thanks. Sounds for... like a plan. Okay, great. Okay, guys. So uh, if you do want to follow our Twitter handle, I retweet articles I find useful. Um, okay, so we got a lot of hope that the chloroquine with the z pack is going to stop deaths. Uh, but remember, 95% of patients heal all on their own. So I'm going to be very skeptical of anecdotal data saying that this is a magical cure, especially when we have the death count growing at an exponential rate. So um, while that's great news and it may help, it's still not going to prevent people from spreading the disease and then eventually having to go bog down the economy and end up on a, on a ventilator. Okay, uh, the Fed came in and backstopped the bond market, the corporate bond market. 
And so they've come in with the biggest issuance of all time. That's some help for the stock market because these guys can buy back their own stocks. But the problem is the CEOs know how bad it is and they're selling their stocks and flipping it to the Fed essentially. Uh, this is what I do expect to see more in the news is pointing the blame on China. China knew about this in November. They jailed the doctors in December. The communist schools were shut down in January 2nd. So they already knew about this then. And they told the general Chinese public on January 22nd. Uh, so clearly they have not been honest with us about this at all. Uh, plus, we had Russia go just dump oil at the same time. And funny enough, Russia shut their borders without any cases well before everyone else. Uh, this is just, this fellow is now diagnosed with the disease. Thanks, Ryan. Um, piles of body bags in New York. Wasn't long ago, we were seeing clips like this coming out of China. So the whole world's rushing to create three items, gloves, masks, and ventilators. We really, uh, there's not, there's no point in doing a hardcore lockdown until we have those in place. Cause when we come back out, everybody has to wear these to, to stop the spread until the vaccine's created. And there's really just unfortunately no way out of this outside of that. Uh, bringing in a birthday cake. Uh, this is in Italy. It is curious why the mortality rate is so much higher in Italy than Germany. Uh, also, it's funny that Japan's numbers suddenly are skyrocketing after they decided to cancel the Olympics. There's a massive shortage of these devices. Um, so that's another reason why they have to do these lockdowns until there's more of these created. Uh, and yeah, it's just complete chaos. The whole world's on shutdown. So if you think stocks are gonna fare well while the world's shut down, uh, good luck. Uh, the same thing we saw in China. So they converted every big building they had into, uh, you know, you wanna call it a hospital, you wanna call it a hospice, one or the other but the whole world's gonna convert every large building we have into setups just like this. And we've been predicting this since early February, late January. Uh, but again, in poorer countries, they don't care. In fact, they're pissed off. They wanna work because they're going to starve. So we can only pull off a lockdown for very, very short periods of time. And this is why I bought such long duration on our options. If we could just force the world to shut down tomorrow for 60 days and miraculously have all the masks for 7 billion people. So what each person maybe needs 10 at, at least. Uh, so it's gonna take some time to get everyone to have enough pain to synchronize a shutdown. Cause if just the US does it, well then we have to shut down our travel to, to international travel. So that still doesn't fix our economy. So really, this is a tough problem to solve. Uh, small businesses starting to print some job losses. And I think we're going to just see this number continue to grow for the next three months minimum, uh, which is a key reason that I don't want to wait around to buy my insurance and perfectly time it. Uh, Huawei is going to be a key company to track. They are really the single piece of news to follow in terms of actions by the United States against China that can uh, escalate tensions. So China's trying to say that, yeah, we'll look at some of their comments. Uh, Trump tells everybody yesterday, get ready for a painful two weeks, more like a painful two months. Again, if we did the hardcore lockdown worldwide today, this wouldn't possibly stop slowing down for at least 30 days. So if we stopped today, I would expect in 30 days, this could flatline. And then in 60 days, it might start to actually reduce. 
Um, so until that happens, there's going to be lots of pain. And remember, we're going to reopen by Easter, he was hoping. He's just telling the people what they want to hear. The world's not ready to understand how bad this is. And he's been slowly baby. So at first, I was quite critical of everything they're doing. But I'm glad to see that they're slowly but surely uh, tiptoeing to the right message as, as, as they prepare with what we need. Again, that's, it's not super complex. We need gloves, masks, and ventilators. A lot of people are pissed off. They don't think this is a real threat. They don't want to be locked in their house. They don't want to have a digital dollar. They don't want to have the government take away rights. They don't want to have the government devalue the dollar and hand out trillions to corporations. Um, so I think we're gonna have a lot of social unrest worldwide, especially in poorer countries. Uh, I don't know. So we know that the CIA does like to produce propaganda in international news to benefit our agenda. Um, and, and the same for all countries. So they all mess around with the media to, to their end goal. So what are they trying to pitch now is that China is uh, sending out contaminated testing kits with the, the virus. Uh, and there's clips about the mass not working. Um, so I, I do, as you know, have expected that this would get ugly uh, months ago, and people were saying I was crazy to make such outrageous thoughts, and here it comes. 600,000 defective masks from China. Uh, here's some. Produce some fake thermometers and sell them to the yes. They should read 98 when the actual temperature is one or two, so more Americans will be infected. There's also all sorts of uh, news clips of China sneaking in biological uh, biological weapons, not out of the U.S., but into the U.S., which is really odd, because um, we do know that they were working with Harvard professors to, uh, especially with nanotechnology related to SARS. Um, so there's a lot of controversy in this. Um, Jason, is it possible to zoom that screen out a little bit so you can see more? Because it, it's pretty zoomed in, it seems like. Yeah, this one right here. And, yeah, and then when you go up and down, can you not jump up and down so quickly? Because um, sure. uh, it's really hard to follow when you jump up and down really, really, really fast. Because you yep. gotta remember, we're, when you move the screen, then all of us have to take a half a second to readjust our where we're looking at the screen and then take it back into our brain. Sure. Does that look good? So that is zoomed in, but that way you see the actual tweet more clearly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. So uh, they came out and said, uh, finally, a realistic number. Um, if we have a, a strict lockdown, 100 to 240,000 deaths in the U.S. without it, uh, one to two million. Um, and I think that's I think that's accurate. If we do, and I believe they they will have to do a pretty extreme lockdown here. So I, I think finally we're getting some pretty honest predictions from our administration and the the health experts running this. Uh, Jim Bianco showing that millennials were buying the dip. I had a bunch of uh, just friends text me. Oh, I bought. I put. 20% back in. Do you think it's the bottom? No, not at all. Um, so now it's 30 days to slow the spread, uh, but 30 days is not enough time. So we've talked about the life cycle of this disease, how it works. Um, so what, you know, what's the effect of the current lockdown? Everybody's going to go home. If you have it, you're going to give it to your family. Um, but still, if you stay in your little, little area, your family gets it. Maybe half the family gets it. It does seem like just about half get it, not 100%. Um, that'll get that R naught to one. So each family member essentially spreads it to one or less. Um, so in 30 days, what we'll see is everyone who's had it probably spread it to their family. Um, but it takes another 30 days to really work the antibodies and become immune. So that's what we need is more like 60. And now Bill Gates says 10 weeks, not eight weeks, like I've said. Um, 
he's definitely smarter than I am at this and been warning people for a long time. Now, plenty of conspiracies that he's the one who's going to come out with the, the vaccine and all sorts of things like that. I'm, okay, from China, some people said Amer America is encountering a Pearl Harbor moment, a wake up call. But please remember the enemy of the US is the honey badger, not China. China is a partner. Medical equipment is on its way. Stay strong, America. So yeah, my conspiracy theory is that uh, either they did this on purpose or not, but once they were aware of it, they let it happen, covered it up, knowing that this would cause a situation that they could deal with far better than a democracy can. Um, and so now they sit there and tease us and continue to send out fake data uh, at the same time that Russia uh, is doing the same and, and crashing the oil market. Norway's $950 billion sovereign wealth fund about to make history as it prepares to liquidate assets to cover government withdrawals. As someone who recently spent almost a week hooked up to a ventilator and probably wouldn't be alive today without one, I can attest to the importance of ventilators and the need for adequate supply. So we're out of them. Those are all being used. The world has to rush to create these. Now our hospitals are firing doctors who talk to the press. Well, and they're cutting their pay. It's just funny because they're wanting hazard pay. Uh, soon you'll have no doctors working. We'll see how that pans out. Billionaire Chinese national Liu Dian Bo bought 34 Australian hospitals for 900 million. They have 8,000 beds. Now the country needs them. The billionaire is shutting them down. His company wants more money from the government. Elon Musk is changing his tone. Uh, and boy, oh boy, are they in for some trouble in their stock. We have extra FDA approved ventilators will ship to hospitals worldwide within Tesla delivery regions device. So at first he's saying, we're not shutting down. Don't worry about this. Now he's trying to help out. So that's good. Uh, she and Tedros should be prosecuted for thousands of neg negligent homicides here in the US after the lies they told they knew as early as January 2nd which is when they shut down all the rich kids' schools. And meanwhile, they're throwing a party in Wuhan. Okay, guys, I don't wanna to go too long because we do have a guest speaker today. I'm gonna to go ahead and put up the trade alert and do Q&A and then get this over to Aaron so we can teach you how to save some money from the good old IRS. Oops. Okay, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do uh, chat box questions first. And then we'll go to and I'll put it up on our options page while we answer questions. Okay, great. So I'm going to go from, I'm going to scroll up and make my way back down. I guess we can all see these together, right? So. Okay, Mike says um, we're supposed to do lots of 200 for the TLT base per 75K. Answer is yes. Um, are we supposed to buy one call for every? 100K following the system or for every. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna have to read the Thursday trade alert, Mike. It's really, really clearly laid out and it's based on lots of 75,000. So if you still have questions tomorrow, I can go over that in great detail, uh, but it is really clearly laid out in every Thursday update. It's literally per $75,000, here's what you should have. So I'm not sure how to, to lay that out more clearly, but remember on, this trading day, it's only people who've upgraded to the basic level. So I don't want to give away what you've paid extra money for uh, to the whole crowd. But I, I, it is super clearly laid out. And I'm happy to answer that in greater detail tomorrow. OK, Barry, I am new pro member. I'm concerned that the honey badger will close gold miners. And so, so 
I have a put option below my gold miners that protects me for two months bearing. So I have nothing to risk, nothing to lose. I, I'm risking a grand total of 1% of my entire assets for the next 60 days to be long gold miners. So if you don't want to risk 1%, then you could skip that position, just do the bonds. But I think the risk to reward is beautiful to be long uh, gold. Now, especially the real asset. So gold miners are one of the few who actually can get the precious metal that's so highly sought after currently. So all the paper products like GLD are being manipulated. They're not even trading near what physical gold is trading. Um, so I love gold miners with the married put. I think gold miners can appreciate 200 to 400% in the next five years, which is how long I think this fiasco is gonna last in terms of governments creating debt, trying to pay off those debts and inflating the economy. Uh, so I love that play. And again, every quarter expect me to slowly but surely grow that position. So right now I risk 10% of our assets into GDX with the married put. With the married put, we have only a grand total of 1% of our total portfolio at risk. So bring that question back Thursday and we will uh, be happy to recommend it, but no change in that position either. Um, he says also, do you think the price of gold will drop? Uh, I think you're gonna see volatility in the gold market, Barry, but I think it's gonna slowly but surely rise in value. So if, if there's a hundred dollars total in the world, we have one gold coin and everybody wanted that gold coin. Well, the most it could be worth is a hundred dollars, right? But if suddenly the monopoly banker puts an extra hundred dollars on the table and everybody wants that same piece of gold, well, the gold hasn't changed, but now it's worth $200. So that's really the mentality we have when we want to invest in gold. So ask yourself, are governments increasing the supply of fiat currencies? And if so, in the long run, you're going to be highly rewarded for being long that position. Are you going to have some volatility? Sure. Can the central banks dump gold to create short-term price stock shocks? Absolutely. So will they do that? Probably, because again, it doesn't help anybody if we're all buying gold. What does that do? I mean, it does nothing. It absolutely does nothing. It's a barbellic relic is what uh, a famous guy once called it. Now, is it going to go up in value? Yeah, I think so. This is one of those rare moments in time where you got the whole world printing money at the fastest pace in history. You got oil prices super cheap. So yeah, I like gold. I especially like those who can create gold uh, and mine it. So I like gold miners. And again, I have a put, a married put at this at, at the 23 strike. So I have very, very, very little to lose. 1% in a period of 60 days. In the long term, I'm thinking that 10% position will grow upwards of 20 to 30% in the course of two years. And uh, I think it can triple in price. Okay, next question we got. Uh, Sandy says, please send an email to learn to start paper trading. Uh, okay, Sandy. So I think your bootcamp materials will be really good. Um, if you're I'm not sure if you're a free trial or not, but if you do buy any one of these advisories, which we have three of, you get a free 30 day pass in our bootcamp, which is great starting material. Um, and if you're super new to all this, I would just do the buy and hold because that literally makes like three changes a year. It's super passive, very easy, no option education needed. And it does give you a 30 day pass into the boot camp where you can learn how to trade options. Um, Galaxy J2 says, did you buy a protection for GDX? Yeah, we have married put. We've had that for almost a month now and we've covered it every Thursday. So that should be pretty clear by now. Definitely go back to your Thursday alert and look at that trade alert because it does tell you exactly how to protect GDX. We have protection into May 
believe May 15th at this point. Gary Barber, China is reporting major outbreak of bird flu. Earlier this week, India had an outbreak in chicken. Yeah, I mean, their pigs are getting slaughtered, the bird, it's a mess. Is it pollution? Probably it's pollution and high population density. Uh, plus, we know these characters, uh, at not just China, but also the US, they're sitting there collecting bats, which are a mammal that adapted to flight. So their immune system's just extraordinary, apparently. So they can harvest all of these diseases without getting sick. So what are they doing? They're taking the bats, they're pulling out these viruses, they're messing around with them, they're mixing them up. Then they're taking them and giving them to new animals that have similar cell structure as humans. And they're seeing what happens. And then they mix those. So they are essentially growing super deadly viruses, not just the US, not just China, not just Australia. Everybody is trying to develop this technology uh, for military purposes. So whether this got out on accident in Wuhan or if it was on purpose, who knows, but I think it's uh, silly to think that it wasn't grown inside of the lab in Wuhan. Uh, okay, Bill Richardson says, yes, thanks. Okay, good, glad we answered those questions. So again, if I sell a call option, Bill, I think we have a flat move ahead. Um, if I buy a call option, I'm trying to get you some extra juice to bet up, which is currently the prediction for TLT. Pat says, will the market crash before the US government does Q most of the QE? Is Amazon out of supply because China isn't producing anything? What are they selling still that isn't food? Will the market crash before the I think the market's going to crash until the government's done uh, just depleting the economy. So that's not a video game. We don't have cheat codes. We can't make every asset go up at once. We can't have an economic output decline and expect a market that's completely based on that economic output uh, go up. So, so yeah, I think stocks are going to have a brutal destruction for the foreseeable future until we do a global 60 day shutdown and reemerge with mass. And then you don't have this huge crisis. It can be swept up with maybe in a year. Uh, if they continue to kick the can and goof around, then it, it can go longer. So that's why I have such long duration on these puts. So we don't know how fast the world's gonna get their act together. Pat wants to know what I think the real unemployment number is. Um, I don't know. I think it's too early. What I do know is that, you know, the world's going to try to adapt. People are making a lot of purchases online. A lot of people are gonna work from home. Small businesses like ours are thriving. Um, but restaurant, a lot of businesses are going to go to the gutter. And how long will it take for those to recover? Can they stay solvent? So the, the easy calculation is that economic output is going to severely decline. And until we fix the underlying problem, it will continue to struggle. Uh, so yeah, is a 30% is a discount on equities enough? When it was already overvalued, perhaps by 50%? Probably not, which is why we're still uh, short the stock market. Gary Barber, a million or so dead Chinese gives the cup plausible deniability for intentionally releasing on the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, if it was an attack and, it, and if it was on purpose, um, it worked. Jim Will says, tech is rising nicely today. Good. That's the inverse tech ETF. So we have inverse tech ETF and we have an inverse bank ETF for a buy and hold, which replaces the puts. Okay, Dean posted something upon information and belief. Iran or its proxies are planning a sneak attack on US troops and more assets in Iraq. If this happens, Iran will pay a very heavy price. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? Anybody want to open their mic before we hand over uh, the presentation to Aaron? Um, hi, this is Bill. I've got a question. Yes, sir. 
Um, I noticed that on March 18th, the TLT went down to 139. Um, were you in the position at that point? We've been in TLT since uh, December. Yeah, 120. We've, uh, we've been in TLT the uh, last 15 months, uh, but we got aggressively into TLT in January. Okay. And so your, uh, you know, your protection on, on that held, <clears throat> I was just, uh, you know, it was, that was the point just before the market bottomed, which seemed to indicate to some extent, it's not um, inversely correlated to the market necessarily. Well, so here's what happened. Uh, oil and stocks crashed at a rate that big money managers were not pre pre prepared for and they're over leveraged. Uh, so the stock market crashed at a faster rate than the TLT rose. So you can see it, it did rise during the crash and it forced big, big, big players, huge players, central banks, Ray Dalio uh, of, of course was one uh, to have to liquidate their profitable treasury position to cover margin calls. So, yeah. yeah. So that was a bummer because we were up 15% in March, which again, I'm not, I'm trying to make you guys a safe 1% a month. That's my goal. So to be up 15% was absolute insanity because uh, we well, predicted my, all that. But um, my, my uh, main question was concerning the, <clears throat> the, uh, the put you had against it. Um, did that show uh, protection at that time or was that also out of whack? Yeah, the put option provided value. Um, I think we got it around 150, somewhere in here. And we went below, so we, we didn't have to worry about the drawdown. We went as okay. low as 139, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. So what happened? The Fed's come out and essentially become a guarantor of U.S. debt. So I'm going to be. Uh, this was before this crisis was before the six trillion in stimulus. So a lot of liquidations have occurred. Everybody's reset their books, and I think they all know the plan. Which is, uh, here's the plan. By the way. Their plan is to offload all the debt into this product right here, which is our product. So the supply side of the treasury market is about to get pounded, but what's everyone done? They've offloaded every treasury. So look at this. Let's see, where's my repo? So you're saying the supply is gonna increase dramatically. Yeah. <clears throat> is that guaranteed to be bought? so that the price doesn't crash? That's my prediction. So in a normal world, let me ask you this. If you, let's say you were making $5,000 a month and you wanted to uh, borrow money from a bank and then all of a sudden you lost your job, do you think the bank's gonna loan you money at a higher interest rate now or a lower interest rate? Well, uh, <laughs> I guess they, you know, if you need it, uh, they'll charge more, but if their cost is less because of what the Fed's doing, uh, they make a nice spread on it. <clears throat> yeah, so, so from a bank standpoint, if you're a higher risk borrower, they're gonna charge you more regardless of what it costs them to borrow, right? right? So America, essentially, the government just lost its source of income because our whole economy shut down. Okay, so, we're in this predicament where we've lost our job as far as the government making money. We've lost it. It's gone. And now we want to spend more money than we did previously. So what do you think naturally the effect of that yield should be? Should it go up or down? Well, if the, if the Fed's... Um... Let's not talk about the Fed manipulating market, but just in a normal world, if, if you lost your job and you wanted to borrow more money yeah, the than rates, you were- the rates would go up. Yeah, so the TLT should go down. Okay. So that, 
basic economics would tell you that, you know, basic math, but th that's not the world we live in. So we live in a world where we have a, a federal reserve, which is nothing federal about it, controlled by the primary dealers. It's literally owned by the primary dealers. So the primary dealers by law do have to purchase this debt. So they, they hope that the foreign, the America's goal is to offload this debt to foreign nations. But if they can't, then the primary dealers have to pick it up. Okay, so. And they can borrow at zero, so. So yeah, so, so they've cleared their books. That's what happened during this. They sold every, so we're seeing the repo markets getting no action now because they don't have any treasuries, they sold it all. So the, in this move right here, every almost every treasury there was outstanding was sold, cashed out. So now they all have a clean slate and the Fed's backstopping the treasury market. So the, the Fed's gonna force this to go up because it's the, this is the only way we get out of this mess. We have to, borrow tons of money, trillions of dollars to the US government. That debt's gonna be funded by primary dealers who control the interest rate levels. And the Fed, guess what they can buy? They can buy treasuries. So, so that's their playbook. They do this, um, let's pull this up. And we can talk about this in a lot more detail tomorrow, but. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Tony Colon has a question. Okay, let me just finish this one really quick. Uh, so here's their playbook. Every time there's a crisis that's too large for the banking system to swallow, they use the, gov the government to swallow it. And so the banks borrow or rather lend money to the government. So every stock crash, this happens, they cut rates to zero. And that creates a self-fulfilling cycle that makes bond prices rally. And then the Fed, they, they never sell these treasuries to the open market because if they did, the yield would spike, they wouldn't make money. So, so they know, all the banks know this is the game plan. We buy the debt and we sell it to the Fed for a profit. And that's it. So how long is it gonna take to sell 2 trillion in debt? Well, we're gonna have a glimpse of that tomorrow. How fast do they wanna rush out and raise this capital. Um, so I don't think they're gonna do it in a single week. I think it's gonna take two to five years to, uh, and I think it's gonna be much more than $2 trillion, unfortunately. Oh, stocks are getting a little sketchy. Uh, okay, Tony, go ahead. And then let's do a few more questions, then let's get Aaron on, I don't wanna. Yeah, Tony said he's good. He doesn't have a question, so. Okay, great. Um, all right, any last questions, guys, before we talk about, you know, funny enough, we're talking about how to avoid paying taxes. <laughs> okay, great. Ryan, can we go ahead and move the screen to Aaron and, and put his mic on? Aaron uh, should be able to just uh, go to the share and hit the share button. Okay, perfect. And it should take over control. Excellent. All right, everybody see that? Looks great. All yes, right. sir. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jason, um, and the, the whole team over there, Portfolio Builders. Guys, that's a invaluable source of uh, information on how to build your net worth, right? That's what we're all doing here is learning how to add to our value. And so that way, you know, upon our passing, unfortunately, we can't take it with us, but we have something to leave to our loved ones or to the charity of our choice or however you'd like to. And so what I want to talk about for the next hour or so is uh, some tax and asset protection principles that are essential to any investor, whether you're a stock trader, a real estate investor, a small business owner, there happens to be a lot of overlap between all of those areas. So even if you know you find yourself saying, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm just a stock trader. I don't need any asset protection. I don't need any tax help. 
I, 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 I can't hear you properly. What was that? There's really bad reverb coming through. Oh, there is. Okay, here, let me. Sounds okay on my side. Is that better? Yeah, it sounds great to me. Okay, thank you. Is that better? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. And so, yeah, again, it doesn't matter what you do, how you're generating your money as an investor, this uh, asset protection and tax mitigation, these general principles are imperative uh, across the board. And so what I'm going to do for the next, uh, again, hour or so is go through some of those fundamental principles, all right, that are going to be applicable to you all. And then at the end, I'm going to uh, take some questions too. All right. So let's see here. Go ahead and get this presentation up. So uh, again, my name is Aaron Sofer. I am an attorney, senior attorney with Anderson Business Advisors. Uh, we have clients all throughout the country. We have offices in three states, uh, Washington, Nevada, and Wyoming. Um, again, over 15,000 clients nationwide. And what makes us unique in a sense is that the attorneys and advisors that we work with at Anderson, we all engage in these activities, okay? So we're all real estate investors, stock traders ourselves. And so it's, there's something to be said from taking advice, learning, gaining knowledge from those that are already engaged in those same uh, areas, those same money-making endeavors. And so in addition to us being a law firm, we also are a, a tax firm as well. Several years back, I think it was about 10 years ago now, uh, we essentially bought a tax firm because we realized that it, as a law firm, when we're giving our legal advice, it, like legal and tax knowledge, it, they're inextricably linked uh, with one another. Because a lot of what we do as investors, it is tax motivated. As the old saying goes, it's not how much money you make, but it's how much money you keep. And so that directly reflects upon how much you're paying in tax. And so we can utilize a lot of different tools that are prevalent in the Internal Revenue Code, uh, as well as state law uh, in creating business entities. And taking that dual pronged uh, approach, we're able to lower our overall effective tax rate while gaining some asset protection, right? So there's two factors that we wanna protect the asset and then also be able to reduce our overall tax burden with regards to the income that that asset creates, that it generates. And so then uh, in addition to the asset protection side and the uh, tax mitigation side, there's also retirement, okay? So that is utilizing uh, retirement plans that are set forth uh, in the federal uh, code of uh, registers, federal statutes. So that's our, uh, our qualified retirement plans, our 401ks, our 401as. I know that those are tend to be the more common qualified plans. And then on the flip side to that, we have uh, IRAs, individual retirement accounts or individual retirement arrangements, okay? And so we'll touch on all of these principles again over the next hour. I'm gonna have to keep it pretty high level. I'm not gonna be able to get too detailed uh, to put it in perspective. Usually I teach this course over three full days. Uh, so it's about 20 hours of instruction. So uh, again, I'm gonna hit the highlights. And then at the end, if we haven't already, we're going to post a link in the chat box uh, and you can access, utilize that link, and you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Uh, I have a whole team of strategists and advisors who will be able to sit down with you, go over your individual situation, right? Because again, I'm going to keep it broad, uh, broad and big picture uh, during this next hour in this presentation. But when you sit down one-on-one, -on -one, and again, it doesn't have to be in person. We could do. That's the beauty of the internet nowadays. We could do everything electronically. Uh, when you sit down one-on-one -on -one with that advisor, with that strategist, they'll be able to take stock of what assets you already have, what activities you're engaged in now, and where you want to be in the future. And then again, that last leg, that estate planning portion, how you want to leave your assets uh, to your loved ones when you're no longer here. Okay. Uh, so 
our challenges, again, it comes to knowledge, all right? Just like you are uh, putting your faith and money with uh, Jason and the Portfolio Builders team because that is their specialty. That's their high value areas, the stock market and being, uh, being able to uh, synthesize all the, the, just the vast amount of information that's out there, being able to synthesize that and put it into uh, actionable terms for you to then uh, take advantage of and generate income, right? And so same as you're putting your faith in stock in portfolio builders, uh, just as you would get on an airplane that's piloted by a licensed pilot, same thing goes with asset protection and tax mitigation. You always want to use the licensed professional. Uh, too often, the mistakes that I see, uh, they relate back to the fact that people engage in a lot of self-help. Okay, Now, there's not anything particularly inherently wrong with self-help, but there comes a point in time when you just have to be cognizant of the fact that, hey, maybe it's time that I refer or rely upon a licensed professional in this area because now you know what, I'm outside of my wheelhouse, okay? So that's self-help. It's not one size fits all. All right, Jason asked me not to use this picture of him, but uh, you know, it, it just, just can't let it go by the wayside, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got Jason right here, yeah, there he is. <laughs> In the gym, buddy. <laughs> uh, oh, but, love yeah, it. So, asset funny. protection and tax mitigation, uh, when it comes to that self-help, typically, you know, whether it's, quote unquote, YouTube university or whatnot. Uh, it's that very 30, very high level 30,000 foot view looking down. And then as with everything, it, the devil's in the details. That's why, again, one size fits all. It's truly a misnomer and it can lead to more uh, pitfalls than benefits. Okay. Uh, so when we're talking about asset protection and tax mitigation, uh, it is crucial for every investor. I don't care whether your net worth, uh, in your uh, your portfolio is currently fifty thousand or fifty million. Okay, you need tax guidance. You need to be able to protect those assets. Now, the nice thing about being a stock trader and, or just trading in the markets is that those endeavors don't inherently generate liability, okay? As opposed to say you're a real estate investor where you're acquiring assets, real property, and either selling them or renting them out, right? There's a lot of inherent liability that's associated with those types of endeavors. Or if you operate an active business, you know, whether it's a restaurant, a retail store, or, you know, buying and selling, uh, we'll just say widgets, uh, just personal property and sending them to customers who purchase those widgets, Right? That's a whole different ballgame because there's a lot of inside liability, liability that is associated with whatever the activity is. Now, when you're invested in the markets, right, there's no liability there uh, unless you're going to buy a bunch of stocks and leave the stock certificates strewn about your floor and somebody comes over and slips and falls on them. All right. Uh, but other than that, uh, trading in the markets doesn't generate a, a whole lot of liability inside that endeavor itself. So what we really have to be cognizant of is our liability, the liability that we as investors create. Because uh, when we are out there, whether you're driving down the street in your car, I and mean, that tends to be one of the highest uh, liability creating endeavors that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis as individuals, albeit nowadays with uh, self-quarantine, you probably find yourself doing a lot less driving, uh, which I guess from a liability standpoint, that is uh, you know nice. Uh, let's see if the... Uh, auto insurers uh, readjust our rates downward because of that. I don't think that's too likely. Uh, but in any case, uh, right, that's one of the most uh, liability or highest liability creating endeavors that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis is, again, driving in our vehicle. That's why states have it be a requirement that you carry vehicle insurance, okay? And so what that insurance does, it insures against foreseeable uh, loss, accidents, uh, you know, hitting pedestrians, things of that nature. Okay. Now, the thing with insurance is that there are limits to the policy itself. And then I'm not sure how many of you guys have actually flipped to the back of your policy where all the exclusions are listed. That's the name of the game with insurance is exclusions, right? Most of these large insurers, these are multi-billion dollar corporations they're not in the business of paying out on each and every claim. And even if it is a bona fide claim, they're gonna make you work 
to get that payout. Okay. So that's the thing with insurance is that you can never be too sure. And so now with that being said, every single comprehensive asset protection structure, it's going to combine business entities along with insurance. Okay. And the business entities, what that helps us to do is it provides a backstop. So if some sort of harm occurs that either is in excess of the liability creating event. So again, let's say you have an insurance policy that's 500,000 and some sort of liability creating event. Again, let's take back, you're driving down the uh, road in your vehicle and you hit a the rear end somebody, it's 100% your fault and they suffer damages of a million dollars. Okay, again, your insurance policy only covers 500,000. And so who's gonna be re- uh, liable for the remaining deficiency, uh, the remaining 500,000 on that judgment? Well, it's gonna be you individual. Okay, and so that's why it's imperative that at the end of the day, we have to protect our assets because in that same scenario, when that victim of the car crash, when they sue us individually, they get that million dollar judgment, 500,000 from insurance kicks in, but then they come and now they can use that judgment and file that judgment and have it act as a lien on any asset that we own in our individual name. That is where the concerns start to ramp up, okay? Especially those of you that are trading out of accounts that are held in your own name. So prior to joining Anderson three years ago, I was in general civil litigation here in Las Vegas. I'm based out of our Las Vegas office. And um, my job was to go sue people, sue business owners, sue uh, defendants to get funds for my clients, for my plaintiff clients. And the, one of the best, or one, the thing that made me ha- most happy as a plaintiff's attorney was seeing that this defendant had a nice fat brokerage account or a nice fat bank account, all right, in their own name. Because that meant once I obtained the judgment against them individually, I can use that judgment to then levy or garnish the amounts that were held in those accounts, all right? And so lawsuits, again, we live in a very litigious society. And so, you know, the past three years, effectively what I've been doing is I'm in my own 12-step program, if you will. Right. My prior life, I used to sue business owners, sue investors on behalf of my plaintiff clients. Now I'm on the flip side. I'm on the preventative medicine side, if you will. So, again, what we do at Anderson, we work with our clients to structure them ahead of time before the harm occurs. So that way, when the harm occurs, it's not if, it's when the harm occurs, then you will be better situated to handle whatever those repercussions are. Because when you do get sued, these are all the different things that that plaintiff can come after, that plaintiff's attorney can come after. So again, bank accounts, cash, investments, uh, you go through that entire list. This is pulled from an advertisement of an asset locator company. So as a plaintiff's attorney, you know, when, when a client comes in my office, I have to qualify that defendant for a lawsuit. I'm not going to sue somebody that doesn't have any assets. So the first thing I'm going to do is hire this asset locator company to do an evaluation of the potential defendant. And so that's why it is crucial to take whatever these very liquid assets are that you may hold in your name right now and move them into say a business entity. So that way it's no longer you as the individual that is listed on title or owns say that brokerage account. No, instead that brokerage account is now owned in a business entity such as an LLC or a limited partnership And then in in turn, we individually own and control that business entity. But the key distinction there is after you are properly structured, it is no longer you, the individual, that is the owner of the account. Instead, you own a business entity and then in turn, that business entity owns that account. So then when that asset locator company goes to do an asset search to, again, qualify the defendant for a lawsuit to see if there's anything for that plaintiff's attorney to go after, then when those results come back, well, hey, no longer is there gonna be this million dollar brokerage account that comes back listed in my name. Because again, it is no longer me that owns that million dollar brokerage account. No, it is a business entity. And uh, so now with that being said, there is definitely a rhyme and a reason as to going to specific jurisdictions because not all states are created equal when it comes to creating business entities within those states. Okay, there are lots of things to be cognizant of. And we'll talk about what those differences are between those states in just a few moments. But 
I just want to tidy up the conversation on the threats here because, as I mentioned, you know, I already threw out the example of a, a car crash uh, occurring and that being the source of liability. Um, that's one of the most common ones, but additionally, uh, property ownership. So whether that's real property or personal property that you rent out, um, again, whenever you own an asset in your own name and then some sort of liability creating event occurs in connection with that asset, well, guess what? You're going to get sued. You own that asset. You're going to get sued. And so as it stands right now, if you own that asset in your personal name, you better hope that whatever the harm that occurred is in fact covered by insurance, because if it's not, then it's you individually that's going to be paying out of pocket for the damage that was incurred. Um, so in addition to property ownership, some other threats, actions of children. So, you know, hey, we love our kids, right? <laughs> but they're huge sources of liability, okay? And, you know, every state has uh, some version of the family purpose doctrine on their books. Whereas if a, a dependent, a child of a parent or parents engages in some sort of liability creating event, uh, then the parents can be imputed. The liability can be imputed upon the parents and the parents be liable for those actions and the harm that occurred in connection with those actions. Um, additionally, contract claims of breach of contract, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, the most common breach of contract, especially right now, um, you, breaches of lease agreements, of rental agreements. Um, I, I say very common right now because there's a lot of, again, at Anderson, we have a lot of uh, real estate investors that are our clients as well. Uh, they tend to, or their tenants right now are anticipatorily breaching their rental agreements by not paying rent uh, because of the federal moratorium, uh, which uh, on evictions and foreclosures. And so, again, th that's a whole separate uh, issue in and of itself. But just know that breaches of contract, again, if you've entered into a contract in your own name and you breach a contract, then yes, that liability will be traced back to you individually. Uh, personal injury, we already talked about personal injury in the context of that car crash, not gonna spend too much time there. Loan defaults in banks. So if you've ever personally guaranteed a loan, uh, this is another huge source of liability because if you've guaranteed that loan, uh, you know whether it's a student loan on behalf of a loved one, a child or a grandchild, niece, nephew, whatever it may be, uh, if you personally guaranteed that loan and then that borrower defaults on the loan repayments, guess who they're coming after? You individually. And what is their recourse? Any asset that you own in your own name. Okay. And then uh, property disputes. Again, we already talked about that in, in connection with uh, our contract claims, uh, breach of lease agreements, things of that nature. So I'm not going to spend too much more time there, but it's important to understand that there are these threats out there. And regardless as to whether you've encountered this firsthand or not, it's only a matter of time, okay? Especially those of us that are out there actively investing. So if you have an active business, uh, you could probably attest to this exact fact that it, it's not if you're gonna be sued, it's when. The average number of lawsuits that our clients, and again, our clients are active investors, whether in the stock market, real estate, uh, or run their own active business, so engineers, plumbers, architects, you name it, it's the average number is three lawsuits that they're going to be in during their lifetime. And so the thing with asset protection and tax mitigation, you cannot wait until the harm has occurred to then try and structure your affairs. This is something that has to happen ahead of time. You can't call us up and say, hey, Aaron, you know what? I, I ran over this bicyclist. Now I need to get my assets into business entities for that asset protection to help shave off some of those uh, point, percentage points that I'm paying to the IRS and overpaying in taxes. No, once the income is earned, you can't assign the income after the fact. So, and same thing with asset protection. Once the harm has occurred, you can't then insert the use of a business entity after the fact. Just There's like our, uh, just like our put options today. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> once, it, once it's already occurred, you get, I mean, as much as we like to, you know, polish our crystal ball and foresee the future, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's an impossible task. And so again, the, having these things in, in place ahead of time, this is what is going to save you in the long run. Because imagine being subject to that lawsuit and now all of a sudden you have to start over from square one, whether you have a $75,000 brokerage account, 500,000 or $5 million brokerage account. 
Again, if that account is in your personal name, that is going to be the easiest source of recourse for any plaintiff that obtains a judgment against you individually. So the way to mitigate that, and I've already hinted at this already when we talked about briefly uh, utilizing business entities, you don't want to own anything in your own name, right? So, and, and what we're going to do is in addition to utilizing business entities to uh, essentially hold our ownership in our various assets, we're also never going to conduct any business in our own name. That's again, that's second purpose for using those business entities. No longer are we going to enter into contracts in our own name. We're going to always enter into contracts in the future, utilizing a business entity. Okay, assuming that whatever the endeavor is that you're engaging in is for business purposes. Okay, so we have to distinguish between personal use and then business use. So we're going to always use business entities for asset protection, for tax mitigation in connection with our investments, with our business purpose. Things that, that fall on the personal side, so such as our personal residence, our personal vehicles, those won't typically go into business entities. And unfortunately, we just have to rely upon state protection. So for example, different states have different levels of homestead protection for your primary residence. So if you reside in a state like Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, there's a couple others, uh, your personal residence, 100% of your equity in your personal residence, doesn't matter whether you have $100,000 of equity or $10 million of equity in your personal residence, it is protected 100% from the claims of creditors, okay? But that's only in a handful of states. So then we've got other states like California that only protects so about $75,000 of uh, equity in your primary residence. Nevada, about 600,000. So it varies all across the board. And then the vast majority of the states up in the Northeast, uh, you have very low homestead protection. So you're talking 10, 15, $20,000. That's all that's protected uh, under your state's homestead protections. Okay. Um, and so again, with those personal assets, we're just going to, we have no other choice than to rely on insurance for those personal assets. But with our business assets, with our investment assets, this is where we can really take control, take the driver's seat to ensure that we are putting our best foot forward. Again, we talked about lawsuits. Now I want to talk a few minutes on taxes and tax avoidance. Nothing wrong with tax avoidance. It's that E word that we have to be careful of, right? Tax evasion. That's illegal. Tax avoidance, 100% permissible. And if you don't want to take my word for it, take the word of these judges. And by the way, how awesome of that is a name for a judge, learned hand. Uh, in any case, he went on to say, anyone may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There's not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. And then Justice Rehnquist on the Supreme Court, he said, there's nothing wrong with the strategy to avoid the payment of taxes. The Internal Revenue Code doesn't prevent that. Okay, so these are tried and true principles. And so how we mitigate our overall tax burden is by taking advantage of and setting ourselves up to take uh, the best advantage of the parts of the tax code where the most benefits lie. And those benefits, the vast majority of those benefits lie in the corporation section chapters of the Internal Revenue Code, as opposed to the individual or partnership, partnership sections of the tax code, all right? No surprise there, especially in light of the 2017 Tax Cutting Jobs Act that was passed you know, a little over two years ago, they afforded a vast majority of those tax benefits to corporations. Now, the only way to take advantage of those tax benefits is to, in fact, set up a corporation, which is one of the best things that we can do from a tax perspective. Because once we now have a corporation that we own and control, then we can start earning money in the corporation, we can shift some income that instead of hitting our personal 1040, we can have it earned by a corporation. And then with a corporation, again, it's got access to all the beneficial tax deductions that are a part of the corporate tax code that we otherwise can't take in our personal capacity as a sole proprietor or through a partnership. Okay, so corporations, they're afforded the vast majority of the benefits under the Internal Revenue Code. And it should come as no surprise. I mean, hey, Politics aside, you know, I think it was uh, Newsweek, uh, maybe three years back, they did a piece on uh, President Trump. And they took a look at, based on several different published pieces 
pertaining to how his assets were structured. And he used a litany of different business entities, corporations uh, to structure his affairs so as to lower, lower his overall tax rate. As of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the tax rate for C corporations prior to the Tax Act, it was all over the place. It ranged from zero all the way up to 37%, okay, or 38%. Uh, now they've revised the tax rate for C corporations to a flat 21%, meaning that we can create a C corporation and we know that every dollar that remains in that corporation's bank account at the end of the tax year is simply going to be taxed at a flat 21% federal. Now we take that and compare that to our individual tax rates, which range from zero to 37% now as, as a result of the Tax Cutting Jobs Act. Uh, and so now we can kind of gauge this allows us some planning and to do some income shifting, where if we know we reside in a, say, a state that also has state income tax. So let's pick on California for a second. If you're married filing jointly and you earn over about $600,000 a year, those dollars that you earn in excess of $600,000, those are going to be taxed at roughly 50%, okay, between state and federal tax. So if you fall into that high income bracket, that well, in that example, the highest income bracket, you know, you're less incentivized to earn those dollars after 600,000, knowing that for every dollar you earn, you're gonna be giving 50 cents to state and local and federal governments uh, as uh, tax revenue. So what we can do, and again, this doesn't just apply to those taxpayers that earn over that threshold. No, this, is, this affords us planning no matter how much money you are making in a given tax year just knowing that we can create this separate business entity, this C corporation, and whatever dollars it earns, it's gonna be taxed at a flat 21%. So some other things that we need to be concerned of when we trade out of our individual name is there's the NITI tax, the net income investment income tax, uh, which is an additional 3.8% on investment income. So trade related income. Now that's gonna be applicable to individuals that earn over $200,000 a year. And uh, married filing jointly, uh, that threshold is then bumped up to $250,000 a year. Additionally, when we're trading out of our own name, we have to report all our individual trades on Form 8949. And additionally, and most importantly, when we are trading out of our own name, we are telling the federal government that, hey, we haven't taken the time to go formalize our business structure. We're essentially operating as a sole proprietor. And the IRS, they release these statistics on an annual year, uh, annual basis. They tell us exactly where they look, where they do their audits. And if you knew that if you were to engage in a trade or business in one form or one capacity, and if in doing so, you would be subject to an audit percent, an audit risk 200% greater than if instead you just created a formalized business structure, such as a corporation or an LLC, which way would you go? I think it's it's not even a question, right? And so we did, it's like a minefield. The IRS, the Internal Revenue Code is like a minefield. And so we just, we don't need to know every single path through to the other side as investors, as stock traders, there's only gonna be several paths and just knowing those permissible paths to get you to the other side without encountering as many minds as possible, that's all that we need, okay? And so as a trader, uh, you do have an option, okay? You can do nothing, all right? You can continue to trade out of your own name. You have no asset protection. You have no tax benefits because, again, you're operating under the individual portion of the tax code, all right? And so when you are trading in, in your own name, all the income that you generate is going to be unearned, all right? So you wouldn't be able to then make contributions to a retirement account. And then you're also limited on the amount of expenses that you can take. You're not able to write off expenses incurred for education or seminars, even expenses such as being paid to portfolio builders, okay? And so what we can do to then alter those facts so as to allow us to be able to take advantage of some of those beneficial tax principles under the corporate section of the tax code is, uh, there's Rodney right there, as, a, as an individual, you get no respect, right? You, the tax code gives you no benefits. And so uh, additionally, uh, can't write off your equipment, computers, trade related expenses. Um, additionally, and quite punitively for us that have been trading out of our individual names and individual capacities, 
it did away with our miscellaneous itemized deductions, our Schedule A miscellaneous itemized deductions as a result of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So a lot of deductions that you used to be able to take on your Schedule A previously, well, now we're relegated to the only way to be able to capture those expenses are through a corporation or business entity. Okay, so better than that, uh, now prior to, uh, or another option, let me phrase it that way, another option aside from, uh, now step up from trading in your individual capacity is if you were to qualify as a trader, okay? Now, I'm sure some of you may have heard of this before, qualifying as trader or obtaining trader status under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, that effect, if you can meet that very high threshold, it's a very high burden in order to qualify as a trader. But if you can meet that burden, then the IRS is gonna say, okay, you as a trader, you can continue to trade out of your individual capacity and we'll still allow you to then take those business deductions, those deductions for equipment, uh, data feeds, any other related business expense to your trading business, we'll let you take without forcing you to incorporate or use a business entity. Now, as I mentioned, that is a very high burden. All right, the trader status, um, the IRS has issued multiple bulletins on this, uh, including uh, topic 429, where they discuss what that threshold is, what the, the bar is that needs to be met in order to qualify as a trader. All right, again, it is a very high burden. So one of the more famous tests uh, in recent memory uh, was this taxpayer. He, uh, and so it's a multi-factor test as to when you cross that threshold to be a trader, essentially you have to, uh, to meet that burden to, in order to be qualified as a trader under the Internal Revenue Code. Your activity, your trading activity has to be regular and continuous. It's gotta be based on short-term market movements You've got to keep a contemporaneous log of all your time spent in your trading. Your trading has to be your primary source of income, and you can't even rely on others to make decisions, investment decisions. So again, it is a very high, and, and honestly, especially with that last uh, bullet point that can't rely on others to make decisions, that can be very uh, punitive in some senses in that you're not going to be able to rely on the knowledge and information from other trusted sources. So in this instance, this uh, particular case, the case sites right there, Endicott um, and, and Nelson, both similar issues before the tax court, they were denied trader status because they had another job. Okay, they had income from other sources. And so what the court said, it's this, if you're gonna qualify as a trader, your trading income must be your sole or primary source of income. All right, in this instance with Nelson, he did over 525 trades in only 121 days. Okay, mind you, there's 365 days in the year. And one of the stipulations to qualifying as trader status as a trader under the Internal Revenue Code is it's got to be regular and continuous trading activity. So even though Nelson in this case did 525 trades in uh, during the year, <coughs> excuse me, that was only over a 121 day period. And so the tax court said that was not regular and continuous, okay? So again, not a trader. Being a trader is kind of like Bigfoot here, all right? It is incredibly hard to attain. And so the best way to go about availing yourselves to the beneficial portions of the tax code where all the tax deductions are is by creating an entity structure, okay? So again, it formalizes your business activity. When you then conduct your trading out of a business activity, you are telling the IRS and any auditor that may be assigned to audit you at a later point in time, you're telling them that you have taken the time to formalize this business prospect, uh, your business process. And therefore they're going to give you a, a leg up essentially because in incorporating, in setting up a business entity, you're going to be provided with, or should have for those of you that have maybe created your own business entities, again, going back to that self-help again, uh, for those of you that have created your own business entities, you have, say, an operating agreement for your LLC or bylaws for your corporation or a partnership agreement for your limited partnership. And so when an auditor comes in to take a look at your books, you know, that's the best thing you could do is present this aura of, hey, I've got my stuff together, all right? The IRS, you know, save for them looking at a specific transaction, 
when they see, when they come into your office, assuming it's an in-person audit into your home office or your office and take a look at your books and records and they see that you've got everything in order, the chances are, and I've been through several in-person audits representing my clients, it tends to be that they are then going to give you some deference there. They're, they look at you and say, okay, you know what? Maybe my time is better spent elsewhere on other taxpayers where we might be able to find more of a benefit to the IRS and collecting some underpaid or uh, uh, yeah, just underpaid taxes, okay? And so now in formalizing your business structure, uh, again, now you're gonna be trading through the business entity. So no longer is it gonna be you as an individual that holds that brokerage account. Instead, it is going to be your entity that holds that brokerage account. As I mentioned before, we wanna own nothing but we're still gonna control everything. And so again, that's back to that uh, asset protection principle is that when you get sued, what, if you get sued individually, whatever assets you own in your individual capacity are gonna be subject to that judgment that's obtained by the plaintiff. If your brokerage account is transferred into a business entity, no longer is it you, the individual, that is the owner of that brokerage account. It is that business entity. And so we've effectively removed that brokerage account, no matter its value, we've removed that brokerage account from being a permissible source of recourse to that judgment creditor, that plaintiff that obtains a judgment against you. Okay, so now we've got the brokerage account opened up in our business entity. And so then we take a look at how the money moves within that business entity. So let's say in the given tax year, you generated a $30,000 profit. Okay, I think we got that right here, the $30,000 profit. So in a limited partnership, uh, which is one common trading structure, uh, most of the time you're gonna either use an LLC or an LP to do your trading out of, okay? Now, LPs, they have in recent years, I don't wanna say fallen out of favor, but they have just been supplanted by the utilization of LLCs, uh, simply because LLCs, you have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, but LPs, they've been around for a long time. They have a lot of case law and whatnot. So, I mean, they're also a very permissible utilization of a business entity for your trading structure. Okay, and so with a limited partnership, there are two, uh, per, uh, two parties in the limited partnership. You have the GP, the general partner, uh, who has unlimited liability for the activities that are conducted within a limited partnership. Now, again, as investors, as traders in the markets, not gonna be a lot of liability, really in, in all likelihood, not gonna be any liability, okay? And then the other part, we have the limited partner, okay? The limited partner, they have no say in the day-to-day -day business of the limited partnership. Again, that is all uh, managed by the general partner. That's why they have unlimited liability. And then the income that it earns from its role as the general partner is active, okay? So that is key there. When you have active income, what you can do is you, that enables you to make a contribution to an IRA, okay? Or even better, if you have your own corporation, we can sponsor your own 401k or qualified retirement plan, which I'll touch on uh, the differences in just a few moments. Uh, but th there are some distinct differences between IRAs and uh, qualified retirement plans. And what makes a retirement plan qualified is that it's set up under federal law, under ERISA, okay? Uh, whereas IRAs, they depend on, uh, largely on state law. And so that's why protections for IRAs, it varies from state to state as far as asset protection and, um, and, and creditor protection and bankruptcy protection, okay? Uh, but again, I'll touch more on that in just a few moments. Uh, continuing on with this example here, we so now we have the brokerage account. The limited partnership is the owner of the brokerage account. We've made $30,000 in profit in this given tax year. And so now typically what I recommend is the ownership allocation be 20% to the GP. Okay, so the general partner is the 20% owner of the limited partnership. And then the limited partner is 80%, okay? And so then now we've generated $30,000 in net profit in our brokerage account this year. So then now we distribute profits, okay? So 20% of that profit is gonna be paid out to the general partner. And then 80% is going to be paid out 
to the limit of partners. So what, 20% of 30,000, what is that, 6K. So then general partner is gonna get a payout of 6K, all right? So that's gonna be income to the general partner. The general partner, maybe some of you have uh, guessed this already, and if you said that the general partner is gonna be your corporation, you'd be 100% correct, all right? So we're gonna create a corporation that is going to be the general partner. So that way we can get income routed. Remember at the beginning of the section, I introduced this section as income shifting. So rather than earning 100% of the profit in the limited partner position, which is typically gonna be us as individuals, okay, us as individuals, so here I am. Okay, that's me, the individual as the limited partner. So um, instead of basically me how, uh, profit, all 30,000, right I'm going to route a little bit of that profit to be paid over to my corporation that is serving as the general partner. Okay, and so then now once the corporation has income, now we can deduct, take deductions against that income. All right. And so now this is what the general breakdown and the how you quote unquote run the money uh, with a trading structure involving a limited partnership. Now I want to take a look at uh, LLCs real quick. It works very similarly. Okay, in that same thirty thousand profit, it's uh, the LLC that holds the brokerage account generate that same thirty thousand profit. Uh, and let's use the same twenty eighty profit splits. So now 6K is going to go to the corp and then the remaining 24K uh, to the member, which is us, okay, individually, and that's passive, okay? So we're individually the member. So the positions in an LLC, rather than a general partner and limited partner, you have members and then you have managers. Okay, they serve very similar functions uh, as in the limited partnership. Okay, whereas the corporation still serving as the manager, which is akin to the general partner position in the limited partnership. So in any case, now we generated that same uh, profit, same profit splits. Okay, twenty percent, eighty percent. And so I, I just use the second example to highlight that no matter which structure you use in a limited partnership or an LLC, we can derive the same benefits, okay? But the key is right here, getting money to the corporation. Because once we have money in the corporation, we can then incur expenses that we otherwise wouldn't be able to write off and have it act as a tax deduction in our personal capacity. Okay, we are taking advantage of portions of the tax code that are only applicable to corporations. And so again, namely that uh, relates to being able to take deductions for data feed subscriptions, uh, 179 in depreciation. So we could depreciate our home office equ equipment if it's over a certain uh, dollar amount, uh, home office deductions, uh, internet. Well, now with home office deduction, you may say, okay, well, I've taken a home office deduction on my personal 1040. You're 100% correct. You certainly can take a home office deduction on your personal 1040. But if you use the simplified method and write that off on your personal 1040, you're limited to a $1,500 deduction, all right? In the grand scheme of things, that's not a whole lot. So rather than running your home office as a home office deduction on your personal 1040, what we do is now that you have a corporation, we set up an administrative office of your corporation in your home, okay? So it, it, it's gonna be the same quote unquote home office, but we're recharacterizing it. And instead of being a deduction that you're taking on your personal 1040, now we're going to run it as an, a, a lease expense, uh, an office expense through your corporation. And your corporation is then gonna be able to reimburse you the pro rata costs that you incur in maintaining your home office. So this is the easiest way to think of it. Uh, actually, from where I'm speaking to you right now, my home office, right? We're all self-quarantining right now. So in my home office, it is one bedroom of my four bedroom house. Okay, so that's 25% of the usable space, not including hallways, bathrooms, and common areas. Okay, so that's one quarter of my house is being dedicated for business use. So what I can have my corporation then do is reimburse me one quarter of the expense of my property tax, of my mortgage interest. I can have my corporation reimburse me one quarter of 
my cleaning costs, my maid service to that tidies up my office when she's here to tidy up the rest of the house. Um, my utility bills, my internet. These are all expenses that we can then have our corporation reimburse us as an employee of our corporation, okay? That doesn't work if you do not have a corporation. You must have a corporation in order to be able to use, to utilize that administrative office reimbursement. And guys, I have clients that reimburse themselves seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And a reimbursement is pre-tax. A reimbursement is not income to you individually. So when your corporation, remember we our corporation in that last slide, it earns $6,000 of income. So then now be, if we just leave that $6,000 of income in that corporation and let it just sit there, well, at the end of the tax year, it's going to be taxed at a flat 21% federally, assuming the corporation is a C corporation. But what we're going to do after that income has been earned by the corporation is now we're going to take deductions. Everything that you see on this page in front of you right now, we're going to take deductions for these expenses that are going to reduce that $6,000 of taxable income. And so we'll very easily be able to reduce all $6,000 of that taxable income between that home office uh, or administrative office reimbursement, uh, between our educational costs, okay, between our professional uh, expenditures, startup fees. Guys, that will easily exceed $6,000. So going back to here, remember we had $30,000 of otherwise taxable profit but by routing a portion of that profit to the corporation and then expensing it out, we've effectively, we've still gotten the benefit of that $6,000, but we've taken business deductions, ordinary, reasonable, and necessary business deductions against that 6K to reduce the overall amount of taxable income to just the 24K, all right? Uh, so again, this uh, another depiction of essentially what I just described to you. So let's say you spent $5,000 in educational costs, right? You paid, you paid for the pro package to um, portfolio builders, all right? So that's a $5,000 expense. And now, let me preface this with, just because you create a corporation, that doesn't mean it's gonna start printing money, right? So you have to go out there and do business. So prior to the corporation, say, earning that $6,000 initially, you may have paid out of pocket using personal dollars that $5,000 educational expense. Okay, and then let's say maybe you had $2,000 of travel expense and then another $1,500 in computer equipment expense, all totaling $8,500 of expenditures that you paid using personal funds. Now, if you did not have a corporation, these would be non-deductible expenses to you. But since you have a corporation or will have a corporation shortly hereafter, you then now avail yourself to the corporate tax code. And then now th that expenditure, that $8,500 of expense that you incurred on behalf of your corporation, we're gonna transfer that ex those expenses over to the corporation's books. So then it is a $8,500 expense to your corporation. Then under that same uh, profit split that we talked about generating $30,000, 6,000 of which is paid to the corporation under its 20% share of revenue. So then our corporation is gonna be able to reimburse us that $6,000, okay? Leaving uh, only a $2,500 remaining debt to the corporation, okay? So this is a very important principle, income shifting and reimbursements. This is how we reduce our overall tax rate by utilizing multiple different tax payers, okay? And so again, in uh, not necessarily in conclusion, but just to summarize uh, kind of what we just talked about, we're gonna use entities such as limited partnerships and LLCs to actually hold our brokerage accounts and then we're going to incorporate our corporations to avail ourselves, to allow ourselves to take advantage of the corporate tax code, all right? Now, I do wanna to briefly touch on uh, charging order protection because as I mentioned initially, when we're trading our brokerage account, it doesn't generate a lot of liability, any liability, okay? That's, again, buying a stock, buying an ETF, not, a, going to generate any liability. The concern is the liability that we as individuals pose to our brokerage accounts and other assets. All right. And so by implementing the utilization of uh, business entities, namely LLCs and limited partnerships, uh, we can then instill charging order protection. And so what charging order protection allows our entities to take advantage of is it will preclude 
any plaintiff that obtains a judgment against us individually, it will preclude that plaintiff from being able to take our business entity from us, right? Because our business entity, that's what holds our, our brokerage account. That's where we make our money. And so that is our most important asset, essentially. And so the number one most detrimental thing that could happen is if a plaintiff got a judgment against us individually, that they could take our account from us. And so by transferring our account into a business entity that's mainly set up in Nevada, Wyoming, or Delaware that has charging order protection, those charging order protection principles preclude that holder of a judgment against us individually from being able to take our brokerage account. All right. So typically we will set up the trading entity in Nevada or Wyoming. Now, Delaware is also a very good state for charging order protection for general uh, business owner protections. But we go to Delaware and Delaware is kind of expensive too. And Nevada just raised their prices as well. So you know what, I'm actually going to go like this. And I'm going to say no longer is Nevada number one. I'm going to say it's number two, because what Wyoming has done in recent years is that they have gone back and they've actually looked at Nevada's exact language in their statutes that protects business owners, owners of business entities, LLCs, uh, limited partnerships, corporations. Wyoming has gone and looked at Nevada's very strong st statutes and Wyoming has beefed up and tailored their statutes uh, to afford those same protections. Okay. And so Nevada and Delaware tend to be more expensive. So due to that fact, I'm going to say Wyoming is probably the number one uh, best state to set up your trading entity because it's a low cost of filing. So therefore low cost of maintenance and you get just A plus protection. No other state provides better protections for business owners than owners of businesses in those states. Okay. So the plan of action here, you need to create a business entity, all right? And then as part of creating that business entity, whether it's a limited partnership or LLC, again, this is part of the conversation that you need to have with the business advisor. Uh, again, when you sit down one-on-one -on -one to do that strategy session, we'll take stock of everything that you're doing uh, so as to be able to structure you appropriately. And so that, again, that'll be part of that conversation as to whether your best uh, set for a limited partnership and LLC, and then we'll want to set up a corporation for you. And then there are different types of corporations. I mean, I've just been talking about a C corporation and it's flat 21% federal tax rate, but there's also S corporations as well, which the income is taxed a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, again, there's no one flat categorical answer as to what's better for you and S or a C corporation. It will depend on your unique personal circumstances, okay? So that is one of the topics of conversation that we will have when you sit down one-on-one -on -one with a strategist to see uh, what the best course of action is for you. So this is just uh, kind of summarizing that same principle. Again, brokerage account held here in the LP or LLC. Then we're gonna incorporate the corporation as a manager or general partner of that brokerage owning entity. And then the next thing and the last thing I want to talk about is estate planning and your living trust. But before I get to that, um, let's see here. I think, yeah, just retirement plan investing. Now I know uh, several of you, uh, a good portion of you are trading out of your retirement account. Now, as I mentioned, there's a difference between trading out of an IRA versus say a, a 401k. Now, some of you may have 401ks that are uh, being administered or sponsored by your current employer. And you may say, well, hey, I, I don't have a lot of permissible investment options. You're 100% correct. That's because not, not because federal law otherwise prohibits you from being able to trade, uh, you know, these ETFs and, and uh, implement and, these strategies. That Aaron, one thing, we do have a lot of our clients operate small businesses too. So I'm sure a lot of them are wondering about the... Awesome best structure to tuck money into the 401k, whether you do um, LLC as a payout to yourself, or you just set up a trust for the whole company or things of that nature, I think would be yeah interesting yeah. to me too. So <laughs> exactly. So yeah, if you go back over here to this corporation, for those of you that are self-employed uh, and maybe have your own corporation, you can utilize that same corporation for this exact strategy. Um, so the, the typical hedge fund manager structure is the one that takes advantage of the, the management fee to 
to get the lower tax rate, right? That's your A20 LP LLC setup. Exactly. But yep. the corporation yeah. will the corporation will probably be if you're much larger, you could get away with paying out dividends at a lower tax rate. Is that going to be your big benefit on that one? So dividends uh, paid from a corporation. You know, Really, we're only going to pay dividends if you've made a ton of money and otherwise want access to that money. Uh, because dividends, it, traditionally, you know, I mentioned the, the phrase or the term C corporation and people, it, it's because it's been, that's been the case for so long is the quote unquote double taxation that's applicable to C corporations. But in light of the tax rate reduction back in 2017 as of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, even the double taxation is roughly on par with the highest, uh, with our individual highest uh, marginal tax bracket. So double taxation is not the threat that it once was. And even so, when you pay out dividends, uh, when the quote unquote double taxation threat was really at its peak was when dividends paid from corporations were taxed at ordinary income tax rates. Um, back in what I think it was uh, the eighties, I think it might have been the revision of the tax code back in 86. Um, it was either 86 or 01. Uh, my apology. I'm not sure which revision of the tax code this took place in, but they otherwise removed that uh, or changed the tax characteristics of qualified dividends paid from corporations. No longer were dividends going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. Instead, they're going to be taxed at long term capital gains rates, which are either 0, 15, or 20% depending on what your overall individual tax bracket is uh, in the given tax year. And I'm pretty sure Apple has the biggest hedge fund set up in the world with this exact structure you have in the middle, just so they can mitigate taxes and invest too. Exactly. Yeah. As I mentioned, everybody does, huh? <laughs> yeah. the, these strategies, these are employed by like the top 1%. This is what they do. And so that's why, you know, it's just about knowledge and access to knowledge and knowing how to implement these strategies. Uh, because, you know, it's one thing for me to show these uh, circles and squares up here and say, this is what you should do. I, again, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have to keep it very broad and general from up here. Now, there are going to be offshoots, caveats of your unique situation that's otherwise going to require us to tweak one thing here. You know, maybe instead of a C corporation, you want an S corporation. Right, so there's lots of factors that come into play, but yes, 100%, Jason, that these basic strategies are employed by the top 1% in order to minimize their overall tax burden, yeah. And so uh, with the retirement accounts, oh, what I did wanna point out was if you have your own corporation, what you can do is then sponsor your own 401k or qualified retirement plan. Okay, and then you can open up another brokerage account up here and make contributions to your own qualified retirement plan up here and then go trade using the funds in a tax deferred manner up in your own QRP. So there's a lots of different methods and avenues to reduce your overall tax burden in a given tax year. So if you're overpaying in taxes, uh, chances are you've just never had competent tax planning previously. Okay. Uh, and so the last thing I do want to touch on is estate planning, especially while most of us are, are cooped up in our homes right now. I've had so many clients reach back out to me in the last couple of weeks just because, you know, they've either been laid off or had their hours severely reduced due to the fact that they're working from home. And now they're taking stock of all those things that they previously had put on the back burner. They put on someday Island. And unfortunately, estate planning routinely is one of those areas, albeit Guys, I'm not sure if any of you have been through a probate. It is not a fun process, okay? A probate, that is the legal proceeding, court proceeding by which assets uh, get transferred from a decedent, somebody who dies, uh, they get, those assets get transferred from that decedent's name to the heirs of that decedent, okay? It requires a court proceeding, which on average takes about 18 months and is very expensive. All right, I wouldn't wish a probate upon anybody. Now, in order to avoid probate, because you better believe that we can take steps to implement uh, certain facets of our overall structure to help us avoid probate. Well, let me rephrase that. It won't be us avoiding probate, we'll be dead. 
but it'll be our loved ones that get to avoid that painstaking process of instead of just grieving and uh, remembering us that have passed away, instead now they're faced with having to hire high-priced attorneys and they don't even get access to those assets that were owned by the decedent uh, until 18 months on average, until the probate case has concluded. So what we can do is instead we can implement a living trust. And so similar to our LLCs uh, and LPs that I talked about, right? We're not gonna own the brokerage account in our own names. Instead, we're gonna own it in a business entity. And then we own that business entity. Same general principles uh, apply to the living trust. Whatever assets that we own in our individual name, instead we're gonna transfer those assets over to our living trust. So that way it's not us individually that owns those assets. No, it's our living trust that owns those assets. And in turn, we own and control the living trust. And so then by that very fact, that's what allows our loved ones to bypass that probate process when we do pass away is because we pass away owning nothing. Instead, it's our living trust that owns everything. And that right there is what allows our loved ones to bypass that probate process. And so on top of that, some other ancillary benefits of having a living trust other than just the probate avoidance. Um, inherently, it helps to keep family relationships intact. Because if you die with just a will or no instructions and no estate planning documents whatsoever, you're guaranteeing probate. And then when your loved ones go through that probate process, there's gonna be a lot of infighting. I mean, in my prior life, when uh, before I joined Anderson three years ago, the most contentious settlement conference I ever was a part of was between brother and sister trying to hash out mom's estate. And they both hired attorneys paying them $400 an hour to argue over these otherwise pretty menial uh, just objectives at the end of the day, looking at it objectively. And so again, by having this living trust, this document that is your estate plan that says exactly what you want to happen with each and every asset that you own and acquire during your lifetime, uh, by having this estate plan, this living trust that says exactly what you want to happen, that alleviates that concern that there will be that infighting because it is spelled out from A to Z as to what you want to happen with those assets. And so inherently it, it expedites that estate distribution because upon your passing, you in that living trust document, you have named a successor trustee, somebody who will essentially step into your shoes and control the trust pursuant to the terms that you set forth during your lifetime. All right. And uh, it also operates to allow us to minimize our estate taxes. So yes, there are estate taxes, both state and federal estate taxes albeit most states have done away with estate, their state estate tax, there still are about a dozen or so states that have their own estate tax. All right, right now the federal estate tax exemption is uh, about 11.6 million per individual, okay, meaning that in, as an individual, you can pass with up to $11.6 million in assets, and that will be exempt from tax. Uh, for every dollar that you uh, that your estate is valued over 11.6 million, there will be a tax assessed. All right, and so uh, the living trust can help to minimize those estate taxes by, especially if you're married, this is, uh, you're allowed to. Um, it's called elect portability, and so essentially you could transfer your estate tax exemption. So as a married couple. Uh, you double that 11.6 million. So what is that? 23.2 million dollar aggregate exemption. And so uh, if you're married, you have that $23.2 million exemption. It operates to minimize the estate taxes by allowing for portability of that, the first spouse to pass. Um, you, you port over the estate tax exemption of the first spouse, meaning that no tax is paid until the passing of the second spouse. Okay. And then very importantly, you don't need an attorney. Now, you may want to advise your successor trustee to, you know, for him or her to consult with a CPA or an attorney, a licensed professional to ensure that all the tax forms get properly submitted if there's an estate tax due and that other just basic legal principles are being adhered to. But generally speaking, you do not need an attorney to help administer or distribute the assets that are held in trust. Okay. And so, 
The living trust, that is that operative document, all right, the most important document of that estate plan. Uh, but there are these ancillary documents that will also help reduce any potential conflict on the back end. So you have your schedule of gifts, anything that doesn't have a title. So, you know, let's just say artwork or jewelry, you know, Rolex watch, antique rug, China cabinet, whatever it may be, you're able to account for those things. Again, assets that don't have a title and you can hand write that in uh, as to who you would like to receive those individual assets, okay? Uh, another very important aspect of the overall estate plan is guardianship documents. For those of you that do have minor children, uh, having a written plan as to who you want to be the custodian of your children, the conservator of your children after you pass away, should you pass away prior to them attaining the age of majority, age 18. Uh, having that written plan in place can greatly reduce any friction between family members on the back end. All right. Uh, some other very important documents are your powers of attorney. Okay. Uh, so for financial and medical purposes. Having these powers of attorney are incredibly important. So these will only become operative if for whatever reason you become disabled, all right? You are not able to otherwise care for yourself. Then in that instance, you have already, ha you already have a named individual or individuals who are authorized to take care of your financial matters or medical decisions on your behalf. So again, you're not just leaving it up to state law or you know your next of kin you are specifically naming those individuals as to whom you want to have that decision making authority in the event you are incapacitated for whatever reason all right again these documents once you need them and you don't have them it's already too late these documents all have to be in place ahead of time in order for you to have any benefit all right and then there's also a pour over will uh, again, if, proper, if the trust is properly done and properly funded, you get all the assets in the trust, uh, then the pour over will will never see the light of day. But the pour over will, it acts as a backstop. You see a picture of a catcher up there. Uh, it's a catch all, it's a safety net. So if any asset was inadvertently left outside the trust, uh, your successor trustee is simply going to be authorized to go before the probate court, tell the probate judge, hey, your honor, apologies, this asset was left outside the trust. It is simply to be redeposited and distributed according to the terms of the trust. So uh, again, at the end of the day, the living trust is that linchpin that holds everything together. So wherever you individually may show up on title as an owner of an individual asset, once you have your living trust drafted, that living trust is going to take your place essentially. And the living trust will represent your ownership in that business entity, okay? Um, so I know I went through a, a lot of information here. Let's see. I'm sure there are some questions. Let's use this time. Let me see if I can exit from my show real quick. Uh, just All right. Okay. Okay, so let me take a look here at the chat. Um, I know I've had several questions. Let me see if I can find where the first question was. Uh, you see the link in there as well that Dean posted at 10.33. Um, okay, can an active 401k with current employer be placed in an LLC? Uh, no. So in order to be able to roll over your current, you know, the 401k with your current employer, you first have to sever employment, unfortunately. Uh, but once you do, yes, you can then roll over that 401k. You can roll that into a 401k that is sponsored by your own business entity. And when we do that, um, you're not going to be limited in your investment choices through your own 401k. Uh, we're going to draft a 401k is nothing more than a trust. It's a trust document. And so we're going to draft that trust document uh, with the fullest investment latitude, fullest investment possibilities as allowed uh, and afforded under federal law. So you'll be able to invest in ETFs, real estate, whatever you want, individual securities. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, you do have to sever employment in order to first be able to roll over your existing 401k. All right. Um, 
let's see here. Any other questions? Uh, probate, heaven forbid your assets are in one state and you're living in a different state of death and all it takes is one small mistake in one account not being set up properly. Oh, so you're just sharing. Yeah, probate, again, it can be a nightmare. And I'm sorry to hear uh, that you did have to, wow, two year probate in two different states. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, if you're not set up properly, uh, that is a realistic possibility and something that we can definitely uh, address um, via an, a, a, an estate plan, via a living trust. And so again, I, I do apologize. I, I sympathize with you there. That is not a fun uh, experience. Uh, what about an in-service rollover? Uh, if your employer allows for an in-service rollover, then hey, so be it. Uh, not very many employers do, okay? Uh, but yeah, if they do allow for an in-service rollover, you most certainly can roll it over into a uh, 401k or other qualified retirement plan that you in fact set up. Um, Lady Bird Will, I'm in Florida. So that must be in reference to just a specific facet of Florida state law. Uh, I'm not familiar off the top of my head with uh, Lady Bird Will, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, what that tells me is it is still a will, okay? And a will guarantees probate, all right? now. If your overall estate, most states have what's referred to as a small estate probate, where if you pass away with under, I think it's like on average, it's between two and 300,000. So if you pass away and your estate is below that threshold in your state of residency, then it's a pretty quick probate administration, okay? Uh, where your executor or your personal representative is able to then affect the transfer of your assets via affidavit. Okay, but guys, absent your estate being that small, and I know you guys are in this class with Jason and the Portfolio Builders team, you're here trying to grow your asset base. I'd be hard pressed to imagine any one of you would pass with less than a, with an estate valued at less than 300,000. Meaning that if you don't have a living trust, you are subjecting your loved ones to go through that full probate, okay? So uh, again, having that living trust in place, again, that's the linchpin that holds everything together. That's the, the tool that you're gonna be able to use to distribute assets over time to your loved ones. You don't have to die and distribute. You don't have to be, I mean, take a look at some of the larger trusts that are still in effect today. You've got the Milton Hershey Trust, uh, which had a charitable component to it. Um, his trust, was, after his passing, his trust was set up so that the profits, a large part of the profits from Hershey, the chocolate bar company, uh, Hershey Kisses, a large portion of those profits are to uh, be or used to fund a orphanage in Pennsylvania. And so same thing with Ikea, same thing. And, uh, you know, I'm using these big names just to exemplify the fact that you can do awesome things with these trusts. Do you have to be worth a billion dollars to warrant having a living trust? Certainly not, okay? Uh, how do you roll over a 401k into a simpler SEP IRA at TD Ameritrade? Uh, the specifics, that's something you're gonna have to refer to the uh, brokerage house itself. Uh, I can't walk you through that process. Uh, are you able to? Yes, you, you can. Um, but I, I, you'll have to refer to that uh, custodian or brokerage house as far as the specifics, what forms you'll need to do and whatnot, okay? Um, let's see, guys. Are there any other questions before I hand it back over to Jason? I have a quick question for you. What's a, sort of the, say you had a, one of the problems we're seeing is a lot of these 401k plans that are available super cookie cutter. A lot of our clients are saying they can't even get out of the stock market. There's not even a money market fund that they can roll over to. So we've literally had people in tears because they couldn't get, you know, we've been telling everybody a stock crash was coming. And because of the custodians of their 401k plans, uh, they've been so limited in what they can do. It's caused mm -hmm. essentially a situation where they couldn't get out of exposure to stocks. Um, so for our company, we actually want to set up a 401k plan, but we don't want our, our employees to have their money stuck in some crappy custodian. I really like TD Ameritrade's products. 
they have a individual 401k offering and a profit sharing 401k. But to do the profit sharing for a group, you have to set up that uh, that entity, the custodial entity, to handle all the money for the complete company. Correct. And then that can tie into whichever brokerage house uh, you want to connect it into. Is that how that would work? Yeah, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, there's always a consideration when you have employees, things are, costs are going to extrapolate. You're not going to have as much flexibility. So, uh, well, th let me rephrase that. You can have as much flexibility as you want. Now, where I see most of my clients, uh, what they tend to do is they set up a solo 401k sponsored by their own corporation. So that way they don't have to uh, worry about, you know, funding uh, retirement plans for other individuals. Because keep in mind, if you do, let's say you run an active business and you have full-time employees and you want to go set up a solo 401k for yourself, you must offer those full-time employees the ability to participate in that 401k. So yeah, for a lot of your everyone's... clients, those who don't have uh, active businesses and full-time employees, uh, they're able to set up a solo 401k where it's just them. And so the administrative costs are lessened to a, a greater degree. But to that effect, Jason, you most certainly are able to set up a 401k uh, sponsored by a 401k or a 401a profit sharing plan sponsored by your business and uh, allow your employees to participate in, uh, in a wide latitude of investment possibilities. But yeah, you need to work on that with the brokerage house to see what type of uh, offerings they allow for that account type. Uh, so I know a lot of, uh, Anderson, we refer a lot of our clients to use Charles Schwab. They tend to be very easy to deal with as well. And so um, j just another note, uh, I mean, me personally, I have my IRAs at TD Ameritrade but then I have my own corporation with a, a sponsored 401k and I have another brokerage account through that 401k through Schwab. Excellent. So, so with the LLC structure, I wouldn't be able to go set up like me and Dean and Ryan with an LLC and then keep the rest of the staff as an employee and then not have a 401k for the company and then try to set up a, all these tax benefits and pay myself as an LLC, right? Yeah, no, that wouldn't work. There are ownership control group uh, principles. So the IRS, the Department of Labor, they put those principles uh, in place specifically so that companies wouldn't employ more highly compensated employees under one subsidiary and lowly compensated employees under a separate subsidiary and give them differing benefits. So yeah, yeah there are sense. ownership control principles. They'll group your ownership together. And, uh, and for testing purposes, even if you had those two different companies, they'd be considered as one under those testing principles. And so, yeah, you would have to offer all the full-time employees the ability to participate in that retirement plan. So here's kind of my takeaway from what you've presented today. For, so just for my company, an example, we might consider setting up the trust for the the entire company's 401k plan. Uh, and then with personal income, I'm not contributing to the 401k. I might want to also have an LLC to transfer my personal income into so I can have a lot of expense write-offs for any trading activities that are exactly. in my cash account. So, so you could to summarize, to get the tax write-offs, you have to have a corporation or an LLC taxed as a corporation. Okay. You can have it. LLC, there's no such thing as LLC taxation. You create an LLC, you have to tell the IRS how you want it taxed. And so, yeah, you can have an LLC that's taxed as a corporation as well. Uh, but that's the key factor right there is to have, to, is to avail yourself to the corporate tax code. And the only way to do that is to have a traditional corporation or an LLC taxed as a corporation involved in your investment activity. So that way you can take write-offs to the corporation that you otherwise wouldn't be able to in your individual capacity. And then to take it a step further, if you set up the double hedge fund structure, now you could pay yourself as a hedge fund manager essentially at a lower tax rate on a percentage of the profits of the LLC? Theoretically, yes. 
if you had enough money to make it worth yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or for anyone else, you could do the tax write-offs if, if uh, you just wanted to have tax write-offs. Beautiful. I love it. All right. See, guys, any other questions out there? I'm going to post that link so you can uh, get one-on-one -on -one access to these guys. Yeah, again, we have a whole team of strategists that are able to, again, sit down one-on-one, -on -one, go through your personal uh, scenario, ensure that everything is addressed accordingly. We're not forgetting any one aspect that would otherwise, you know, result in your structure looking differently. And uh, there's no cost to it. So by all means, take advantage. Uh, we have these professionals sitting by waiting for you. Wonderful. Well, we really appreciate it, guys. Any last questions before we let Aaron go? Yeah, have we got the contact information for Anderson. Uh, yeah, so I keep posting that link down there, Donald, if you want to click it and uh, you can go and register for a free consultation. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Did you have a question, Jeff? Yeah, I had to step away for a bit. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Just want to make sure that uh, can, will this be made available later to review? Yes, this will be in the replay today, so you can rewatch it. Sweet. Thanks, Jason. Very good, Jeff. All right, bye. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming in and providing the. Excellent, excellent advice for how to save some money and keep My those pleasure. tax dollars out of there and protect. And I, I know the probate process too. That is horrific. And uh, if it's not set up, it's just really bad. Yeah. And again, putting the living trust in, I mean, it, yeah, it may force you to confront your own mortality. Hey, but we're all sitting in, in quarantine hearing about hundreds of thousands of people dying on a dying within the last couple months or well, hopefully not hundreds of thousands but potentially hundreds of thousands so you know there's no better time while you're cooped up in your own home just to knock your estate plan out of the way so that way you never have to think about it again yeah really makes sense all right well wonderful we'll get this replay out it'll be seen by a lot of people and we really appreciate it awesome awesome all right guys thanks sir have a wonderful day. Happy investing. And uh, we'll talk soon. Sounds okay. good. Excellent. Thanks, everybody.